Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, a very good warm welcome and a good afternoon and warm welcome to the BHL Day 2024, the year of the Cicada, buzzing with 17 years of biodiversity achievements, presented as part of our 2024 Biodiversity Heritage Library Annual Meeting. I am David Igledon, Chair of the BHL Executive Committee, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of us all at Biodiversity Heritage Library. Before we begin, I have a few logistical details I'd like to cover. Today's program is being recorded and the recordings will be made available on the BHL Day event page. We also welcome CBS News today, who will be filming our keynote speaker's address. I would additionally like to remind you that we have all voluntarily agreed to abide by BHL's code of conduct by participating in this event. Further details on that code of conduct are available from the link shown on the slide. For those of you joining us online, welcome. And to let you know that closed captioning has been enabled and you may adjust your settings for closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. Again, for those online, please use the Q&A feature to submit questions for the speakers. These will then be addressed by the session moderators at the end of each session. Our theme for today is directly linked with the dual emergence of broods 13 and 19 of the periodical cicadas, which coincides with the 17th anniversary of the launch of our BHL portal this month. We will open with a keynote address by Dr. Jean Kritsky, entitled A Tale of Two Broods, the 2024 emergence of periodical cicada broods 13 and 19. Following this, there will be two sessions reflecting on some of the many achievements in both the biodiversity and BHL communities in the past 17 years and the challenges for the future. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the three sessions. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jean Kritsky. Jean is Professor Emeritus of Biology at the Mount St. Joseph University in Cincinnati, and also adjunct curator of entomology at Cincinnati Museum Center. He has been teaching at the college level now for over 47 years, lecturing on various subjects, including entomology, evolution, zoology, and the history of science. Jean was named a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1996, and a fellow of the Entomological Society of America in 2019. He has published over 260 papers and 10 books, including four on periodical cicadas. Thank you for joining us today, Jean, to share A Tale of Two Broods, the 2024 emergence of periodical cicada broods 13 and 19. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's all right. Good afternoon. I always loved the Field Museum. Part of my PhD work was done here with the great uh, Hank Dibus, curator of insects. Hank was one of the kindest people I've ever met in my life. And uh, he was just a just loved insects and periodical cicadas. And indeed, I dedicated the tale of two broods to Frank and his career. Uh, I'm sorry he's not here with it. He died many years ago, but uh, I, I just, every time I come here, it's like the spirit of Hank Divis again, just very friendly and collegial and uh, just a, a wonderful gentleman. My goal of today is to give you a little bit of a background of what's going to happen uh, uh, this in the, over the next few weeks, but then also go and touch on the, the history of periodical cicadas. No one generation is going to solve this problem. And I want to introduce you to some of the strange people that have been involved with this and even I issue a challenge to help me on some of this, these projects. And then talk a little bit about uh, uh, periodical cicadas and their influence on, on climate change. And so with that, let's start. This year, 2024, is a dual emergence year between broods 13 and brood seven, uh, 19, excuse me. Uh, to make it more confusing, brood 13 is a 17-year cicada, and brood 19 is a 13-year cicada. 
Now, these numbering systems were started by a gentleman I'll introduce you to in a little bit, but basically a brood is a year class. Uh, and there was a lot of confusion about periodical cicadas back in the 1880s and 90s because there were several competing mechanisms to name them and number them. So finally, in 1893, Charles Marlott decided to put an end to this confusion. And uh, he said, Are every 17-year cicada that emerges in 1893, that's going to be brood one. Every 17-year cicada that emerges in 1894, that's brood two. And numbers one through 17 are reserved for 17-year cicadas. For every 13-year cicada that emerged in 1893, that's brood 18, and numbers 18 through 30, the placeholders for the 13-year cicadas. Once that was done, we were able to easily map and actually see where these patterns were emerging that were making a lot of confusion. For example, in Cincinnati, we had two distinct broods, brood 10 and 14 as they're numbered now, but they came out four years apart. And so we'd have cicadas, but they came out 13 years earlier, and they came out four years later. And then 13 years again, what, how do you make sense of this? So careful mapping and using this number system helped clear up a lot of this confusion. It's possibly the only numerical system created by a government bureaucrat that's still valuable today. Because if I say brood 13, you know immediately that is a 17 year cicada. If I say brood 19, you know that's a 13 year cicada. So already there's inherent information involved. What you're seeing here is the uh, distribution of uh, brood 13 on the left and brood 19 on the right. Now, what's this? these dual emergences are not necessarily rare. There's After we did this numbering change in 1893, we've now established there are 12 distinct broods of 17-year cicadas and three distinct broods of 13-year cicadas. Well, 12 times three is 36. So over a 200-year period, you can have over 30 of these dual emergences. Most times, they're miles and miles apart. This year, there's a contact point. And that's created this media feeding frenzy that we're going to see a cicada getting. We're going to see double the numbers. Uh, the problem with that is the two broods are at the extreme southern end of brood 13, at the extreme northern end of brood 19, where the numbers aren't that great. But let's make it a little, make it a little worse. You can't tell the broods apart. You can be in the middle of a lot of cicadas, and you won't know which one's brood 13 or 19. So we're not expecting as many as the media thought, uh, as the, the internet thought. I shouldn't say the media. The media has been pretty good about this. But uh, uh, it, it's not going to be what people are thinking. The only way we're going to know for sure if they overlap is to get a really good map this year using Cicada Safari and iNaturalist, and then come back 13 years from now and see where did brood 19 cicadas emerge, and four years later to see where did brood 13 cicadas emerge. And then we'll know they were together. Now, I did some work with Monty Lloyd from the University of Chicago in 1998, and I, we did find trees that had healed egg damages uh, from both broods in the same tree. So, no, they could overlap a little. That's all we know. But what's interesting this year is they are going to be seeing uh, so all seven species of periodical cicadas will be emerging. Uh, there are three different species of 17 year cicadas and four 13 year cicadas, and they fall into three species groups. As you can see on the on the uh, three 17-year cicadas, uh, Septon decim, the one on the far left, is larger and has these broad orange bands, the underside of the abdomen. Cassini is smaller and has no coloration on the underside of the abdomen. And Septon decula has pencil-thin mustache lines on the abdominal segments. And that's it. You look at the next slide over, you'll see there's four species. And what we have are two of the decim species group. Magisicada neotridecim is on the far left of the 13-year chart. Uh, Tredecim is next, uh, Tredecassini is the second from the right, and Tredecula is on the, on the far right. But the trouble is, the two decim species don't always overlap. And so, but in the species that we see, the Tredecim one doesn't necessarily occur this far uh, north. So it's going to be really difficult to use any kind of criterion to figure out by that one unique species, are we seeing an overlap? So what, if you haven't had a chance to go out uh, in your area, if, if you live in the South or in the, the or in the Midwest, they're screaming right now in, in North Carolina and South Carolina and uh, in Georgia, for those who live in those areas. Uh, but if you're waiting around the greater Chicago area, we're waiting for an evening when the, the soil temperature reaches 64 degrees Fahrenheit, give it a nice soaking rain, and the nymphs start crawling out of the ground. They start crawling up a vertical surface, as you see on the upper upper left, they lock their little tarsal claws in there, and then they start 
pulsing and the oh in the back in the middle top middle there uh, nymphal skin starts to split it's a white adult inside it wriggles out of that nymphal skin pulling itself out hanging almost upside down like you see in the middle left photograph it sits there for a few minutes slowly wriggles its abdomen free and you'll notice these little white filaments that you see coming out of the the around the cicada those are its tracheal tubes from its nymphal stage being pulled out pulled out of the uh, adult if you thought puberty was bad <laughs> they finally free the abdomen as you can see on the on the lowest uh, uh, far left the wings are all shriveled and it starts to pump fluid through the wings to expand them and eventually you'll see as you see the from the second from the right bottom right a typical cicada appearing except it's all white so it's expanded its wings, the wings are held 10 like, but it hasn't hardened and scleratized. So that takes several more minutes. The up from the very top, uh, first image to the bottom, uh, uh, the, the bottom uh, row, second from the right, that takes about 90 minutes. Turning completely black takes another 90 minutes. So when you, if you have the joy of experiencing this, you've got to be outside. It's uh, this happening at night. You've got a flashlight, limited peripheral vision. Watch this thing slowly happening. It's like having a David Attenborough special in your backyard. If you have a chance to see this and you've got kids, get them out there. Make them wait to watch this. Periodical cicadas are the gateway drugs to natural history. After they've emerged and darkened like that, they climb up to the tops of the trees, and it takes five more days to, the, to continue to mature and harden the exoskeleton before they start singing. And more will come out each day, each day, each day. Hundreds. Hank Dibus did a census here in Chicago but by counting the emergence holes, and he found that under every acre, this is per acre under trees, not in like open fields, acreage under tree, they were emerging at a rate of 1.5 million per acre. Now, they're not in greater Cincinnati. I've measured these in the suburbs of Cincinnati, and it wasn't as much. It was three quarters of a million. But that's still a lot of bugs, no matter how you want to, you want to look at it. After five days, they start to sing, and they use this little structure behind the, the wings. So you see that I'm, I'm holding here and pull back the wing. That white, uh, white structure is the uh, timbal. It's, it's membranous, but it's lined with chitinous uh, uh, rods that as muscles pull it in, it makes a clicking sound. It does it several times a second. The abdomen is, uh, is nearly hollow, is a resonating chamber, and that cut makes the call. The females don't have timbals. Instead, they respond by flicking their wings at a particular point in the mating call. Uh, after the male call, males gather in coursing centers and trees, and they are screaming. As male males fly in, Female flies in, she hears a male call, she flicks her wings. That's the, if she turns and faces him, she'll, he'll walk forward, do another mating call and so on. Mating can, can ensue. But sometimes a second male nearby might start singing towards the end of the first male's call so she doesn't flick her wings at the right time for the first male, but for the second. So there's some things. If you have experience of these emergencies, uh, the loudness, which extends up to 96 decibels, that's louder than just flying into a hair. Uh, uh, you'll hear it'll be like eight, uh, 90 some decibels, and then it drops down to like 82. And I guess that, that for males who've been unsuccessful after two or three times, they'll fly to another tree. It's like a giant single cicada mating bar. Uh, and uh, if they can't attract a mate in this one tree, they'll go to the tree across the way. If he's successful, mating will ensue. And uh, there's a pair in copula. And then a few days later, she will start laying her eggs in the terminal ends of the branches of trees, as you see there. And this becomes noticeable by the uh, third week of the emergence, and it happens, continues to happen over as, as the emergence continues. About that same time, we start seeing cicadas with fungal disease. Uh, this is a, a, a fungal disease that, uh, well, it, it, it's, it makes male, it, it changes their behavior so that the males actually, with the disease, will start flicking their wings in response to another male's call. And uh, uh, the, the abdomen falls off. I'm holding one on the, on the upper right, uh, the, the right-hand half side. It's just I picked it up, the, the tip of the abdomen started to fall off. And they can fly like this, spread spores all over the, all over the world. After the eggling is complete, uh, a few days, a few weeks later, your trees might look like this. 
Uh, we call this flagging. It's where the egg laying has torn up the vascular tissue so much that the water didn't reach the leaves or the, leaf, the, the twig may have broken and, and that stopped the water flowing so the, the leaves uh, wither and die. Uh, it looks like, it looks, looks terrible, but it's actually like a natural pruning. And in a paper published in uh, the eight, late 19th century, uh, out of, it was titled, Out of Evil Cometh Good, was how cherry growers were saying that they noticed that they had a bad cicada, uh, actually a bad locust year, but the next year they had a harvest they never expected. It's like a natural pruning to allow a gray flower, grayer flower set uh, in, in the next year. I um, got it set up in the upper right is my egg harvesting system. I took egg nests and you keep them moist, keep them in water. And I collected the nymphs as they emerged from their nests. Let's see if this works properly. Yes, they are really cute when they're small. These are one hour old periodical cicada nymphs. And what I did with these was, uh, of course I made, a, I, made a, I made a movie and I took them out back to our yard before my, uh, uh, my wife Jesse and I purchased our last house. We made sure we had cicadas in the yard and uh, we dumped them on the ground and within a minute they're gone because they're extremely vulnerable to spiders and ants and beetles. So they have to get underground quickly. So they find a blade of grass and they get right down between the grass and the dirt and they're out of sight for the next 17 or 13 years when they emerge again. That's what's gonna happen now here in the next few weeks. And as I mentioned, this fascinating life cycle uh, wasn't discovered just recently. Our study of cicadas uh, goes back to 18, 34, when William Bradford, the second governor of Plymouth Colony, wrote in his history of, of uh, Plymouth Colony, and the spring before, especially all the month of May, there was such a quantity of a great sort of flies, like for bigness to wasps or rumblebees, which came out of holes in the ground and replenished all the woods and ate the green things and made such a constant yelling noise as made all the woods ring of them and ready to deaf the hearers, which I love the way they wrote. Uh, they have not been by the English heard or seen before or since, but the Indians told them that sickness would follow, and so it did in June, July, and on the sheep heat of summer. I have an asterisk behind 1834 because that is a brood 14 year, and that's the brood that emerges at Plymouth Colony. And I had the opportunity to look at the original, and actually it says 1833 on there. So I had to research, well, how did he write this thing? And it turns out, uh, he uh, wrote them over, uh, wrote it over, by, over a few, a few years, several years later, and he finished it in 1850. He never mentioned cicadas again. If they were coming out in 1833, they would have merged in 1850. Uh, not sorry, in 1650, and he probably would have mentioned them again, but he didn't. So it's most likely he had, he was experiencing what we now call brood 14 cicadas. Now, shortly after these these accounts coming out, we started calling them locusts. 1834, uh, big flies for the uh, bigness to wasps. Uh, 66, uh, uh, flies had a kind of tail or a sting, a like plague is said to happen frequently in the Ukraine where they are infested with great swarms of locusts. Interesting. Uh, 18, 1675, great swarms of strange flies. Uh, finally, in, in, in 1705, the Virginia Rebellion, Matthews wrote, swarms of flies emerged. Uh, but then in 1715, uh, Reverend Andreas Sandel wrote, Singular flies, the English call them locusts, and the same insect eaten by John the Baptist. Uh, also experiencing cicadas uh, was uh, Paul Dudley, uh, who visit, uh, experienced the 1699 emergence of what's now called Bird 11. Uh, he visited it again in 16, uh, 1716 and 17 years later. And he wrote this, he started researching this, and he wrote in his unpublished manuscript, uh, uh, locusts is Latin for lobster, but he crossed it out. And then he started using biblical metaphors. He talked to Reverend R uh, William Weld, who said, well, you know, uh, John the Baptist ate locusts. They come out of the plagues like locusts. They come out of the ground and sing like it's mentioned in Micah. And they have all these different biblical verses that sort of summarize this. So Dudley wrote this up and sent this to the Royal Society. And they read his paper, but they didn't publish it because they got into a big discussion. Dudley had confused locusts for cicadas. So they wrote him. He said, ah, oh, I have it from Reverend Weld. These are locusts. So the Royal Society arranged for an Egyptian locust to be mailed from Cairo to Boston in 1735. It got there. And uh, uh, 
Dudley writes back saying, "Yes, uh, this stuff. I have made this mistake, but I'm sure you, you won't. I'm sure you won't forgive my error. But no matter what we say, the common people will call them locusts going forward, and they did for another two centuries. And then uh, uh, Linnaeus's uh, protege, uh, Per Kalm, wrote uh, by the Englishmen here. They've gotten the name called locusts by the Swedes living here. They've been got. They've gotten the name grasshoppers, and in, in Latin, they could be called cicada." And uh, that's where the, so that's our early history of this this terminology. So with that cha change of terminology, if you go to the wonderful uh, uh, Chronicling America website and look at old newspaper accounts, you want to find cicada records. You can't use cicada. You got to use locust, and you'll find all sorts of references. So with that as a background, of course, Linnaeus described uh, cicada septendecim. That was the first of the, of the cicadas to be described. Uh, then we start seeing more of the scientists in North America starting to play a role, and indeed. Uh, Nathaniel Potter, who's pictured on the far left, a uh, physician, actually experienced the 1763, 1800, actually 1783, 1800, 1817, and 1834, always with the intent to write something up on the locusts, but was too busy with the practice to do so. So he finally decided to do it in 1834. He enlisted the help of Gideon B. Smith, who you see pictured next to him. And Smith was another physician who also had experience with newspapers and uh, uh, he was an assistant to Skinner in an agricultural newspaper. And uh, together, and although it's under Potter's name, they published the 17-year locust, the first standalone publication on cicadas with the first color plate, which you see here in the illustration. And uh, Potter dies in uh, 1843, and Smith takes over, and he starts crowdsourcing cicadas. He's writing articles, the newspapers. I'm expecting the locust to come out in Mississippi this year. I'd appreciate it if your readers send me notice. And they did. In 1858, he was so concerned about wanting to prove 13 years of cicadas, he offered to return people stamps to them if they wrote them. And by the time he died in 1867, he had documented the existence of all the known broods of cicadas. So that's our foundation. A little local note. In 1854, the photographer in Chicago made a daguerreotype of a 17-year cicada. This cicada is the great, 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 great grandfather of the cicadas emerging now. I think it was worth, worthwhile for him because cicadas will sit pretty still if you just don't bother them. And so it was able to take a nice long exposure. Uh, but uh, this may be among, I'm not sure, maybe somebody can find, verify this, if this is the oldest known photograph of an insect. So. Moving from uh, Smith, we can move on to Benjamin uh, D. Walsh and uh, Charles Valentine Riley. Walsh was a classmate of Darwin's at Christ in Cambridge. He eventually emigrated to Rock Island, Illinois. Uh, he uh, became what we now call the state entomologist, working with the now what's now the Natural History Survey. And uh, he also was the editor, one of the two editors of American Entomologist. And Riley, who is a gifted artist and also an entomologist in Chicago, joined him in that effort. And uh, in 1868, uh, they were getting letters from people about 13 year cicadas. And so Walsh wrote Darwin. And the, the, this is the front page of the letter. Uh, My dear sir, I do not at all, this is what Darwin wrote back. I do not at all know what to think of the extraordinary cases of the cicadas. Asa Gray and Dr. Hooker were staying here and I ex told them of the facts. Uh, it turns out what he, Darwin expressed was he didn't he, he didn't think that the 13 and 17 year forms should be separated as a different species unless some other mechanism could be fine for the separation, and so that's what's going on since. But even Darwin was concerned about these things. Uh, moving into the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th century, here's Marlott that did who invented the the brood counting system, uh, and his fam famous book, The Periodical Cicada. And if you go to the BHL. Uh, uh, link from Cicada Safari. There's a wonderful page with all sorts of, of uh, antiquary papers and, and books on cicadas to, to read. Uh, James A. Hislop uh, continued collecting the, uh, the uh, records for cicadas and uh, in 1936 produced the first USDA movie on cicadas narrated by him, which is really quite amazing. One of the sad things I was working on a sabbatical back in the uh, 80s, was uh, I went to the uh, agricultural archives and I was looking for the original notes they, they received from their letters that they sent, the USDA sent out for cicada information and so on. And most of that stuff has been thrown away. Fortunately, Hislop 
copied all the dates and towns and counties for Brood 10 and Brood 14 and, other, and a couple other broods as well. So we have the data. Uh, also in the archives, uh, it turns out Marlott had a copy of Gideon Smith's unpublished manuscript. I have been looking for that for 40 years. He had a copy. Uh, Riley had a copy. It might have been the same that Marlott had. Uh, there are two other known copies out there, uh, but it has been lost. I, be I believe I'm able to find about 70% of it in pieces and things that he had published. But uh, if any of you in libraries find something just as unpublished manuscript, Gideon Smith, please email me. I would love to see that. So that takes us into the uh, into the early 20th century. By the late 20th century, we've got, uh, uh, this was a, a, a gathering that we had at my former university, Tri-State University, now called Trine University, where we presented Hank Divis on an honorary doctorate for his contributions to the cicada studies and his work in the study of evolution. And uh, I'm on the far left, Frank Young, my undergraduate advisor is on the, is next to me. Chris Simon, who is still very active in the field is next to him. Hank is in the middle. Then there's Tom Moore from retired from the University of Michigan. Uh, Joanne White, who was at the University of North Carolina, and Monty Lloyd from the University of Chicago. Uh, my advisor, PhD advisor, Lou Standard, had already left when this picture was taken. We had a reception for Hank at my house. And to give an idea what Frank was like, Frank walks up to me and he says, you know, Gene, if a bomb fell on your house tonight, you'd set periodical skater research back 17 years. <laughs> but Standard published the Periodical Skaters of Illinois, and it's that map that you see here on this slide that's creating a lot of the buzz this year. That contact between Brood 13 and Brood 19 in the center part of the state. And that was one of his uh, contributions when he published the Periodical Skaters of Illinois from the Natural History Survey. It's available as a PDF, uh, so if you go to the survey, uh, uh, you can register your name and download this, and it's a fabulous read. Uh, that's taking us to the end of the 20th century. If we move forward, to the lucky first century, Chris Simon is still active as I am. Uh, John Cooley, who, along with Dave Marshall, uh, published the uh, uh, species description of Neotrodesum, who great, great uh, discovery. Uh, Jesse Smith, who's coordinating the project for iNaturals for this year's cicada emergence, and did it as well for Brood 10. Uh, those individuals, plus 225,000 people who've downloaded my cicada safari app, are helping us get really good detailed, detailed maps of where the periodical cicadas are. It's an EFE. How many of you have cicada safari? A lot of you don't. It's free. All you need is your email because if you find a cicada population that I don't expect is, is where it should be, I'll email you to verify it to make sure we get good data. Darwin wrote to a, uh, to a man by the name of Smith that accuracy is the highest merit in natural history and the hardest merit to attain. And one of the things about all these old cicada records is there just names and, and papers? We don't know if they really were looking at your uncle cicadas. We now have photograph vouchers. And for Brood 10, we received 561,000 photographs of periodical cicadas. By taking the GPS data and saying, well, let's, let's make them at least a football field apart, it was still 61,000 records. So we're getting validated records photo vouchers with longitude, latitude, date, time in the metadata. It's a much more robust uh, system that we're getting and succeeding in. So I'd like to thank all of our partners as which uh, BHL is, is a member as we help uh, uh, continue this, uh, this work this year. The last topic I wanna to touch on is cicadas as bugs of climate. Periodical, cicada, uh, uh, periodical cicadas evolved because of the ice age. And let's face it, the ice age is climate change. And uh, the, the model we're working on right now is as the gradual cooling was occurring before the last ice sheet made its, reached its maximum, that's selected for longer life cycles. As the ice, sea, ice sheet started to retreat, uh, uh, selection then favored synchronous species uh, emergences to get those numbers up, and then to uh, uh, stop uh, hybridization between multiple broods. That might come out here earlier, really late. There was a selection favoring uh, prime number life cycles to stop that, to further enhance and increase the number of individuals uh, coming out with a single emergence. And as you can see from the glacial maximum on the, uh, on the left, the 17-year cicadas have invaded those areas. So in the last 20,000 years, since the ice sheets retreated, broods 13, 10, parts of 14, 5, 8, and, uh, have, and uh, brood two have all moved into these glaciated areas. So the ice ages 
why we have periodical cicadas. They are bugs of climate. And if you look at the distribution of the 13-year cicadas, they all stayed south of the glacier. So it looks like we had a, a refugia in the southern part of the United States, and then there might have been a refugium up in, uh, uh, Frank always thought it was in uh, western Wisconsin, that was where the 17-year cicadas were hanging out, and then they dispersed from there and north or what have you. But that's our model we're working on right now. So we have periodical cicadas because of climate change. An ice age and the retreat of the ice age, that's, that's robust climate change. I mean, it took 20,000 years or so for it to happen. We know that cicadas emerge when the soil temperature reaches uh, 64 degrees Fahrenheit and after a good rain, as I mentioned, and that's when you see them popping out of the soil like you see on the one on the far left. The, um, that's when they start coming out, big numbers. And what, in addition, and so what's happening is that uh, as our spring temperatures have gotten warmer, they're coming up earlier in the, in the, in the spring. I did a study about published in 2004 that found that uh, prior to 1940, the average date of emergence in Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, was between the 20th and 29th of May. Last time they came out uh, between May 13th and May 17th. This year, cicadas emerged in Augusta, Georgia on the 14th of April. Now, it's not, it doesn't mean that if we keep warming up, we're gonna have cicadas emerging in January because they have to count, they count the years by noticing the fluid flow in the trees. Well. As we get further, further into the early in the year, photo period controls leaf set and flower set. So there's a there's an upper limit with how, how, how early they can come out, but it's a combination. So this these warming temperatures uh, may be affecting the maybe tricking the trees and the, the multiple fluid flows because one of the things that we predicted would happen with gradual warming is more off cycle emergences, and these are cicadas coming out four years ahead of schedule. And in the last uh, uh, cycle, broods two, five, 10, 13, 14, and 19 have all had significant early emergences. The asterisks are two places, one in Cincinnati and uh, uh, one in uh, Chicago. The uh, brood 10 uh, came out in such numbers in the year 2000, four years early, that they overwhelmed their predators. They sang, they mated, they laid eggs, those eggs hatched. Now the question is, will they come out in 13 years or shift back to 17? What do you think we, what do we, think we have to do? We wait. I have, up time, I have at times uh, spent 17 years waiting for the results of an experiment. If I worked on fruit flies, I could have this done in six months. Well, it turns out that some came out 13 years later, but not enough, they all breed. We found spent the empty shells and wings. Four years later, they came out with a vengeance. All the offspring from the early emergence in the year 2000, plus more accelerating cicadas from brood 10. And so in just five locations where this happened, we had 33 locations where this happened. And it didn't just happen in Cincinnati. We had a major acceleration in Baltimore, in DC, in Indianapolis and Louisville. Whatever the cause is, it's not local, it's continental. And so the prediction is that we'll start seeing these larger and larger off-cycle emergences. And what this is for the two that emerged for Chicago in the year 2020 and Cincinnati in 2000, 2017, we've now seen the origin in Cincinnati of a new brood six in Ohio. So slowly but surely, Cicadas are revealing their secrets, but it follow, it's not by just one individual or one lab alone. It requires centuries of work by Potter, Smith, Riley, Walsh, and many and others. So I, I don't know if I'll be around to, to get the final answer, but I'm gonna tr certainly try. So what's next? Well, if you can't stay for the emergence this year, never fear, there'll be Brood 14 coming out next year, possibly at a, at a city near you. So look for our next publication of the Ohio Biological Survey on Brood 14. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kritzky, for that fascinating talk. Um, 
I just got a bit of time now for some questions and answers. If anyone has any or they'd like to ask Dr. Pritsky, um, we'll start with the room and then we'll move online. And there will be some roving microphones, I believe. Um, please wait till the microphone comes to you to answer the question or ask the question. Even. <laughs> um, Okay, <laughs> Dr. Kirissi says if there, are, if you have no questions, there will be a quiz. <laughs> oh, well, I have a question from someone online, so I think we're safe from a quiz. Excellent, please go um, ahead. The question online is, is it correct that when some species interbreed between different periodices, that the egg result in males with all one periodicy and females are all the other periodicy? If correct, is it the female eggs inheriting the mother's or the father's and how? I'm not aware of any evidence of the hybridization that would establish that. So uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, the evidence for hybridization uh, is, is rather scant. It looks like they, they can overlap, but, we, but it turns out in many cases, like uh, uh, the last time we had a, a, a dual emergence like this in 1998 with brood four and brood 19, they, uh, the 17 year skaters came out several Days later than the thirteen-year skaters, and they were a few hundred, a few miles, several miles apart. But uh, I'm not aware of any evidence that would support the idea of a of a sexual selection in the in the uh, timing like that. Thank you. What's known about the biological mechanism that um, leads to the clock that allows them to emerge in this such a prolonged period of time? That's a great question. Uh, we know they count the years by detecting fluid flow in, in trees. So in the, uh, they, the eggs hatch in, in the summer. Uh, they for the first few weeks, they're feeding on grassroots and they go to about eight to 10 inches below the surface by New Year's Day. And uh, they'll be able to detect on the trees of which the roots they're sucking upon uh, the fluid flow for the next year's leaf set. And that, that's how they mark the year. What we still don't have a good handle on or even know is how they remember what year it is. That's still, that's still a mystery of biology. It's one of the things that we'd like to know. There are experiments going on uh, to look at this. Uh, Trouble is, it takes a few years to verify it. But we do know, for example, that uh, if a periodical, uh, the difference between 17 and 13 year skate is, is how fast they grow in the first five years. Uh, Monty Lloyd and Joanne White published a paper on comparing that growth. And if a 17 year cicada nymph should molt a second time within those five year period, they'll come out four years early. And that's what led to my prediction of an early emergence in the year 2000. Uh, in 1991, I had my students in my ecology class, first week of class, I hadn't prepared, I'm department chair. So what's the first class always in a lab? It's the scientific method. So I had them read Monty's paper, Monty and Joanna's paper. And if we had dug up cicadas that day, what stage would they be in? They wrote their prediction on a piece of paper. I had them put in an envelope. I had them seal the envelope. I had them sign the seal. We went to the maintenance shed and we got shovels, went to the orchard and we dug up cicadas and they were bigger than they were supposed to be. Monty and Lloyd and Joanne said that if that's the case, they will come out four years early. So here's 1991. I'm saying, we're going to have cicadas in the year 2000. Well, that's like telling kids don't smoke, you'll get cancer. No, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's waiting. But I dug them up every year, every year. And uh, indeed, at the National Entomology Meetings predicted a major early emergence uh, in the year 2000. And boy, did they come out in big numbers. It was incredible. Now, follow-up question. Yes. Sorry. Does that suggest something about maybe a metabolic driver? You know, if they're bigger, they have a different set of needs. That certainly does work. And so one of the things we talked about is the idea of a genetic switch that triggers another four-year cycle to their growth. And that uh, if you have the model uh, N times four plus one, where the N is the number of time that, that switch is flicked in their development, well, if it's, uh, if it's three times, three times four is 12 plus one is 13. If it's four, Four times four is 16 plus one. And there are 21 years to case I'm at four years late. And that was switched as five times. Uh, so uh, that may be what's going on. It could be that uh, as they develop underground, that's what's what's occurring as they, as they as they age. But we do know that cicadas are not uniform in their growth. I've dug up cicadas that were eight years old 
and found fifth instar, fourth instar, and third instar all from the same brood at different levels in the soil. So their, their growth is plastic. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, how would you study and how do you know, for example, that they're eight years old underground and how would you find out or what do we know about how much nymphs, how active they are, like how much they move within the soil, how far they may move from the tree under which they first dropped as a first instar? So we determine the age by what year do they emerge and lay their eggs. And that's a geographic thing. So when we um, want to study, let's say cicadas from brood 10 in their growth, we go to an area where brood 10 is the only brood there and we excavate every year and we dig. Um, we, uh, we estimate that the, uh, uh, the cicadas probably move mo no more than maybe a meter in that time. And if they go the wrong direction and don't find a root, they're going to die. There's a high mortality underground. Ten, you know, if you realize it's a 50-50 sex ratio, and I had, I had an undergraduate, we make undergraduates too, uh, count the number of eggs in females. And we found an average of just over 500 with a range of lower 400s up to 600. But think of it, you have millions of cicadas, half of them are female, and they're gonna lay 500 eggs. So the, under, the eggs are really in the trillions of eggs going into the trees. Uh, whereas, uh, and when we look at the number that come up of a, under a, tree, a single tree from my census, it looked like it was about 8,000 came out of a, under a single tree, but we estimate almost 40,000 eggs were laid in that tree. Uh, but you dig. And uh, they're down usually uh, eight to 12 inches in the early years, uh, four to four to eight inches later. The so many of the places, the soil is just a uniform 56 degrees. These are ectothermic, so they're not a lot, they're not tooling around. They're moving very slowly. And then um, can I just ask a follow-up question with the first in stars, you said they're feeding primarily on grass um, roots. Is there any other time when they're feeding on herbaceous or do they switch? We, quite consistently to woody vegetation. They, uh, that's the work of Monty Lloyd, and, and uh, uh, he found uh, uh, grass. In fact, one of the recommendations, this was, in terms of if you want to stop cicadas in your yard, round up your yard after the cicada eggs, have, uh, or before the cicadas hatch, the eggs hatch, they'll starve them to death. But uh, uh, he only looked to uh, verify the, the roots because that was the closest to the surface. And then they do burrow down to find uh, trees, and it's woody plants, yes. Thank you for your talk. Oh, thank you. I really found your film interesting um, of the nymphs. When it comes to stragglers, do you track those as much with, when it comes to the nymphs and watch them go back into the ground? And do they come out at a different time? Well, many of the nymphs that we see holes or they see nymphs on the ground, a lot of them are on for iNaturals and Cicadas Harbor, people digging in their yards and or they lift up a, a, a paving rock and there's all these tunnels underneath there. So they hadn't emerged yet. Uh, sometimes in the spring, if there's a heavy rain, that could actually break the surface of the hole and they can they can reclose it up, uh, but they haven't really emerged per se. Uh, we do, uh, uh, for cicada safari, we do count uh, nymphs that have uh, uh, emerged with red eyes and those two black patches they get behind the, the head, that's occurring just probably maybe the day or the day before they are going to emerge. Uh, so uh, if back in, uh, oh, back in uh, March, I was getting photographs of red-eyed nymphs uh, all over the area where they were expected from either brood uh, uh, 13 or, or 19. But we know they would come out this year because those red eyes don't develop until November of the year before. So then we'll have to make the next one. Last question, please. So. <clears throat> Hello, Dr. Kruski. So first thing I noted was a quote, periodical cicadas are the gateway drugs to natural history, which is a good segue into the question that I have here. So I wrote out, your professor, Dr. Frank Young of Indiana University, inspired you to embark on the path of cicadas and through his expertise, sense of humor, and infectious passion, as you wrote here in your book, A Tale of Two Broods. So through the endeavors such as the BHL, what steps should scientists, natural historians, and the like take to spark a wonder for and underscore the importance of studying the natural world? Just love it. I've never met a man in my life. I, my dad sold insurance. Insurance is like making a bet with a big corporation. I'm going to die this year. And they're saying, no, you're not. Uh, Frank was the only man I had met uh, who clearly loved going to work every day. He often sparked his lectures with jokes. In fact, some of the fraternities at IU used to have a, one student would actually just record all the jokes while the others took notes for him. But now 
I met Frank, he was US Army Medical Reserve. This is 1972. I had long hair, I was anti-war. That didn't matter. His love of natural history just pulled me in. And he had the greatest impact on my life of any individual other than my father. And uh, so if you find somebody that has that love of natural history, that, that, that just, you can see their eyes light up when you talk about it, inspire them, give them research projects, give them readings, uh, get them in the field. Uh, when I finished my PhD, I got this call from Frank, I'm sending you 10,000 beetles. And I said, no, I said, well, you're going to a small liberal arts uh, college at a university that has an, mostly engineering students. If you stop doing research, you will never do research again. So I, this is a project he wanted to save for his old age, but he already reached his 80s, so he's, <laughs> it beat him to it. And uh, so I spent uh, uh, several years working on uh, four species of Tenebrionids, but he was right. He instilled this idea that you know, I found them just as fascinating. Uh, and I, I didn't do my PhD work on, on uh, periodical skaters. I did them on the anticlocephality, the most primitive living hemiptera. Uh, but uh, again, be enthusiastic. Uh, that's what's most infectious for people who, who lecture in, in university or colleges. Uh, the kids, you'll, they'll see it. You'll, if you get your course uh, evaluations, they'll tell you how that, that, that the lectures were uh, captivating. Just have a lot of fun with it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good career, but I hope we'll stay with us many years, but given what's going on now with funding and else, it's probably in a little bit of danger, but uh, that uh, uh, that work is, is hopefully not done yet. So, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again, Dr. Kritsky. Uh, it now gives me great, great pleasure to invite our next moderator up for the uh, second session of our day, and that is to introduce Leora Siegel from the uh, Lenhart Library over at Chicago Botanic Garden. Leora, please. And it's my pleasure to introduce Kerry Havens, who is our next speaker. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said there will be three sessions and please hold your questions to the end of the third session. It's my pleasure to introduce Kerry Havens, Chief Scientist and Agani Vice President of Science at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Thanks so much, Leora. And one slideshow, find mine. Yeah, getting there. Start. Okay, ready to go. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Leora, and um, all the rest of you for um, coming and spending a little time listening about moving to a pedigree management approach for living collections of critically rare plant species. So, um, you know, I'm from a botanic garden, and uh, my role is conserving the rarest of the rare species. And, you know, for, for decades, oh, oh, there we go, we, uh, focused on seed banking plants. Um, and that is essentially just putting their seeds dry and cold into a freezer. And there they can last decades to centuries. But not all plants make seeds that can withstand that treatment. And um, so I wanna talk to you a little bit about how we're adapting some uh, zoo approaches for plants. So imagine, if you will, for a moment, if every um, wild and critically endangered plant had a linked plan that conserved it both ex situ and in situ, that the collections of these critically rare or extinct in the wild species um, were informed based on genetics and not haphazard, that there was a species champion for each of these rare taxa, and that captive breeding programs actually supported the reintroduction of these species to the wild. This is something zoos have been doing for decades. Um, so I have a picture of an adorable little black-footed ferret there, um, extinct in the wild or formerly extinct in the wild. 
Um, the last 16 living individuals were brought into ex situ collections. Now there's about 300 ex situ and 300 um, reintroduced. Brighamia insignis is a very similar case study. Um, it's a plant extinct in the wild. There are about 300 ex situ, and we have started a captive breeding program for that species planned with the software from zoos. And so this is really important for the species we call exceptional. Um, we estimate that anywhere from 30 to 40% of plant species either don't make a lot of seeds or make seeds that can't withstand drying and freezing. Um, so we have to maintain these species as living collections in gardens um, or in cryopreservation or tissue culture collections. And these aren't just some, um, you know, oddball taxa. They're things that uh, many of us care about, including oaks and palms, the corpse flower that some of you may have seen bloom, um, avocados, chocolate. Um, you know, we want to make sure that those don't go extinct. Um, so when we're managing living collections, um, we have to think about all the risks that those living individuals face um, that are different than if we were to just put those seeds in the freezer um, and put them into suspended animation and, and let them wait for the day that we um, bring them back to life. Um, so for living collections, um, those species can hybridize, um, they can lose genetic diversity through genetic drift, um, selection or adaptation to cultivated conditions, um, they can get sick, they can fail to reproduce, and they can die. Um, but zoos have been doing this, as I mentioned, for decades. Um, and what they do that has really shifted how botanic gardens are thinking about their rare species is they manage all individuals of a particular species as a meta collection, a worldwide collection. Um, so, you know, previous to this, botanic gardens, you know, a certain garden would be responsible for a species they'd bring in, you know, 20, 50 trees, they would let them grow in their collection, but they weren't really thinking about what other gardens had those trees and should we be doing crosses between gardens to maintain genetic diversity. We didn't have a stud book and zoos use stud books to track the pedigrees of all the animals in their collection. We didn't have population management software uh, but now we do. So zoos use something called PMX, um, which is a population management software. And it relies on either genetic data from doing DNA fingerprinting or pedigrees to look at how closely related individuals are and decide who is the optimum mate for a particular animal. Um, this slows the loss of genetic diversity in the collection and prevents inbreeding. So inbreeding is just as bad for plants as it is for animals, including humans. And so we need to um, put methods, methods into place to avoid inbreeding in our collections. So this is our um, poster child. This beautiful plant is um, Brighamia insignis extinct in the wild, um, did live on the uh, island of Kauai in Hawaii, um, but it is cultivated in at least 57 different botanic gardens around the world. And um, it is what we call recalcitrant. Its seeds can't really be dried and frozen. They won't last more than a few years. It's also quite short lived as an individual in a collection. Plants typically live about 20 years before they die. The main collection of this species was at National Tropical Botanic Garden on Kauai, and uh, it had become so inbred there that it could no longer make pollen, and it was effectively sterile. And so we decided to see um, what was left around the world. Um, so we asked every botanic garden who grew this plant to send us a leaf. We did a genetic study. We estimated kinship. We tracked paternity. Um, we put it into PMX. Um, it allowed us to uh, model a lot of different scenarios. Um, this is the genetic diversity study. 
And um, these are just showing the three main um, genetic lineages in this species. Remember these all originated from the Nepali coast of Kauai, but what remains in collections is different around the world. And so um, you can see that the National Tropical Collection was um, dominated by the yellow lineage, um, but that was really underrepresented in continental US and European collections and um, those had much more representation of the green and blue lineages. And so what this allowed us to do is say, who should we cross with whom? Um, so we looked at optimal breeding pairs and um, what PMX spit out was a plant from the Waimea Arboretum and one from Switzerland. And so then we had to <laughs> ensure that we could make that cross, which meant shipping pollen um, from Switzerland to Hawaii. Turns out that's really hard. Hawaii has a lot of importation um, issues. And so we actually um, crossed that plant um, with one in the mainland and ultimately got seeds repatriated to Hawaii. Um, PMX also tells us who's genetically redundant in the collections, and these are um, plants that could go out on display, could be used to attract attention um, by the public for fundraising campaigns, that sort of thing, but aren't critical to the genetic management of the species. And when you look at the crosses we did here, um, and these are plants that were at Chicago Botanic Garden, we have two selfs. Um, and then crossing with two different plants from the U.S. Botanic Garden and one from San Diego Zoo. And you can see how those outcrosses are much more robust. They're flowering, um, they made pollen, they set seed. And all of this um, led to, oh, I went the wrong way. There we go. Led to us actually reintroducing it in the wild in Kauai. Um, this is at the Limahuli Preserve um, at the Nepali coast. And we did that last summer. So now there are about 400 plants back in the wild of this species. We are taking this a step further and applying this approach to many critically rare species um, of the Pacific Rim. We're working in Mexico with an oak, in Hawaii with a couple of other taxa, Ecuador with some aeroids, Indonesia with the corpse flower and others. Um, and so, oh, and in Guam with a cycad. So we are um, extending this, um, teaching others around the world how to use uh, the new software we've developed and, um, and really trying to change people's mindset about how we manage the rarest species. Um, as a meta collection instead of individual collections. And these are the folks that make it happen. Um, so um, kudos to my colleagues in the zoo community who have really worked hard tools for us to use in uh, botanic gardens. And there it went. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why it disappeared, but it did. Um, but uh, yeah, that was the end. So um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Our next speakers are Dima Moserin and Jeff Ower, both from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Global Names Architecture. Uh oh, something is wrong. Uh, we see it here. 
Just a moment. Yeah, the field logo back up. Okay. So what I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, one specific part of, uh, I'm sorry, um, about one specific part of um, PHL by Diversity Heritage Library. If uh, you can imagine a gigantic book with uh, 60 million pages, which that will be BHL, and uh, at the very end, uh, there is an index of scientific names, so you find names that you're interested in, and uh, it will tell you where to find this name in uh, um, in this gigantic 60 million pages book. So this is uh, our adventure, how we worked on uh, creating this index. Uh, this so uh, my name is uh, Dima Mazarin. Um, for a while, I was a wildlife photographer, and later I decided to switch to programming, but also with biodiversity. Um, so um, in 2008, uh, almost when uh, BHL appeared, uh, so BHL was one year older, uh, there was a group of people who decided that it is very important to have an, um, uh, a way how we can connect scientific names to known information in the world. Uh, so uh, you have a name, and this name uh, moves you to information about this particular species. Um, and uh, I started to work uh, with uh, on this project, uh, Global Names Architecture, and. Uh, um, BHL was a natural way to implement uh, this kind of approach where we have a name and this name leads to information. Uh, so uh, we used um, existing proje uh, projects, um, particularly made Taxon Finder, uh, Lakshmi Akela made uh, 1980, and uh, I, together with uh, David Scherkhaus, made a uh, a program that combined them all together. And uh, for 45 days on these uh, expensive uh, servers, we were calculating uh, index for scientific names. And uh, we did succeed. Uh, we did have index for BHL. But the minute we finished, it got fossilized. Um, people would come to us and say, this is wrong. This is wrong. And, Sorry, we cannot do, cannot do it 45 days again. So that was definitely a problem. And uh, we went to NSF and said, we want to fix this thesis. Uh, we don't want fossilized uh, index. We want a life index. And um, uh, after trying many different languages, different approaches, uh, we came to one that happened to be better and faster. And not just faster, um, so we were able to create this gigantic index of 60 million pages in three hours on a laptop. So that was a huge <laughs> improvement <laughs> compared to what we had before. So now when uh, we need to, like if somebody says something is wrong, we see if we can fix it and we can fix it um, pretty fast. And uh, when we get new uh, data, when we get new algorithms, we can fix um, uh, the index um, quite, quite um, efficiently. Um, so we uh, found 12 million name strings. Um, and uh, uh, these name strings happen 200 uh, million times 
in BHL. Uh, so after that, um, Jeff, uh, uh, my colleague from uh, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, and I started to work on, uh, uh, we, we started to think, how can we use this index to do something different, something also interesting? And um, we came up with uh, things where uh, we can find nomenclatural events, which is original descriptions of species. Like uh, somebody thinks that they discovered new species, they publish a paper, and uh, we want to find this paper in this gigantic book. Uh, we found that we can, so on average, Every um, on average, a species has uh, three different names because sometimes people uh, make uh, by mistake they describe something. Uh, sometimes we, people find that this name already existed and they give a new one. Uh, so in the end, uh, every species every species on average have three different names, and uh, uh, we found like algorithms to combine it together. So no matter what name you use, you still can find all information in BHL. Um, and uh, uh, we also were able to create sort of a fingerprint for every uh, separate item in BHL uh, and uh, understand what this particular item is about taxonomically. Um, so about original descriptions. Uh, we found uh, approximately, uh, so uh, we do it by algorithm, so it is not precise. We sort of uh, do detective work and we try to figure out, can this uh, particular paper be about uh, original description of the species? And when we collect enough facts, we say yes, uh, with a probability of 98% it is, or with probability 80%. So uh, with between probability of 80 and 98%, we have approximately um, 700 million, uh, se oh, sorry, uh, 700,000 um, uh, uh, potential uh, descriptions, original descriptions. And uh, uh, the probability that they are actually original descriptions is pretty high. So for example, if you look for Pardosa Maestra, we can find uh, exactly the paper uh, page on BHO that first first time uh, described this particular species. Um, another thing we can do is um, uh, to create sort of a profile of the whole library, of the whole big uh, book of 60 million names. We can find uh, what people like uh, to study, what people do not like to study. And of course, uh, uh, charismatic uh, flora and fauna wins. Uh, so for example, if we uh, look at uh, birds, um, birds are only 1% of all species. But if you look at BHL, 10% of BHL is about birds. And we actually decided to, to use this and um, with all the advent uh, of artificial intelligence, we wanted to see if we can use this information about birds to create an experiment and uh, make a semantic search for uh, BHL. So for example, in this, um, uh, here we ask, um, can woodpecker suffer from concussion? And uh, BHL says, no, no. Um, and uh, it actually gives uh, exactly where this information is in BHL. Um, so what is next? So we made this index. However, index that we made is not perfect. Um, uh, and um, uh, we did not find all occurrences of scientific names. And I explained why. So now I think we have only 60, 70% of all occurrences of names which means that 30, 40% of data is hidden from people. Like when they search for a name, they cannot find this information. And we want to uh, open it for people. 
So um, we uh, want to apply for a grant. Uh, we are doing it this summer. And um, what we want is to increase dramatically number of detected names. And I will explain what problems we have. So one, the most uh, obvious problem is abbreviated names. Like people very often uh, do not uh, uh, spell name com uh, completely. If they already mentioned genus, they would uh, make genus abbreviated. And first we tried to uh, do it in naive way. So if you saw genus right before that with the same uh, letter, like for example, S, we would uh, assign this genus to everything else that is abbreviated and we created tons of non-existent species as a result. Mm -hmm. So we want to use a statistic and taxonomic intelligence approach, which hopefully will be very good. We will see. Uh, another um, common problem is capitalized names. Um, so by um, in the code right now, uh, genus is capitalized and species epithet is not. However, if species are um, after, uh, named after geographical entity or a person, he, uh, people thought it is impolite to uh, make it low case and they capitalized it. And sometimes people just love the species and they, oh, how I want it capitalized. And um, that creates problem for us now. Uh, so we need to figure out how, um, and uh, we definitely can do it now, or even now, but as soon as we try, uh, we create a lot of false positives, uh, what is not a name. So we do need to fix it. And false positives is uh, the biggest problem that we need to solve. So for example, some smart taxonomists, um, like uh, call, uh, uh, so they create ambiguous scientific names. Like in this case, Lago Karacha is actually um, a move, which uh, there is a genus La, and somebody says, oh, Lago Karacha, great, great choice. <laughs> or um, another uh, taxonomy is called um, species habeas corpus. So all legal literature goes like uh, scientific uh, biological literature. Um, uh, people names are very often scientific uh, scientific gen genera, like all of these names. Um, vernacular names very, very often uh, are scientific names as well, and very often completely different scientific names, not what uh, uh, we had. And um, um, uh, optical character recognition, so when people scan uh, um, literature to put it in BHL. Like you can see, sometimes even human cannot read what, uh, uh, because you know, books get old, um, they got damaged by water, by, you know, uh, different things can happen. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, no matter how well you try, you cannot get good data. So uh, we can relax our rules or finding names almost indefinitely. But if you cannot catch false positives, uh, uh, we will make BHL unusable. Um, and um, we hope that we uh, know how to do it. Uh, we still need to try many different ways. And most importantly, we don't want to create another facilized uh, name index. We want it to stay as fast as it is now. Um, and uh, when we uh, solve it, if we solve it, um, we can add another layer to the index and use vernacular names or common names. Uh, because right now, uh, like for example, bear with me, right? Is it about a bear or is it not? Um, so with the vernacular names, we have tons of problems. And uh, if we find out how to do false positives, we will fix it. And this is it. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, BHL team, uh, and Martin especially, um, for support and consideration.
Thank you, Dima. Next up is Rod Page of Biostore and the University of Glasgow. Okay, I think we're good to go. Yes. Awesome, okay. Hi, I'm Rod Page. Um, I'm possibly gonna speak way too fast. So if I lose you, uh, you can find out a bit more about what I'm gonna talk about up here. I'm on, no, wrong button. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Blue Sky. Is anybody else on Blue Sky? Oh, wow, cool. Um, I have a blog which discusses some of these ideas, and I'm going to spend a bit of time today talking about a project called Biostore. I have a terrible time with the titles for talks. I'm hopeless. I get a title, I, I give it. Uh, by the time I give the talk, everything's changed. So if you know the title as Articles, Annotation, and AI, I'm sorry, there's no annotation at all, but there will be articles and there will be some AI. So I have spent a lot of time playing with BHL. Uh, BHL is, is extraordinary, it's a wonderful resource, um, but from my point of view, it has to be problems. What I'm really interested in is articles. That to me, as a scientist, is the kind of core unit. Our BHL is full of content, species descriptions, like Dima was talking about, papers on ecology, behavior, distribution, and so on. The big challenge is finding them. And one reason for this is, is BHL is essentially a library project. It's a big digital library. Like as Dima explained, it's a big book with 61 million pages. This uh, is a screenshot of BHL. This is looking at a single scanned volume of a French journal on frogs called Alites. Now this is how sort of an archive thinks. I've got a volume, I've scanned it, here are the pictures. But as a researcher, you want an article. That's what you cite. And the question is, where are the articles in the scanned volume? So to try and find that, I decided to build a tool called Biostore. Now, this is a project I've been working on since about 2009. Uh, it's got about a quarter of a million articles, all from within BHL. And the sort of graph at the right shows you sort of sense of progress. So this is, click the right button, growth over time. And this is sort of growth in each individual year. So you can see sometimes I got really excited. Lots of data came in. I had some projects I was working in. Other years, got a bit bored with it. It's very much a passion project. I don't know if you've come across this phrase called a bus factor. The bus factor is the number of people it takes to be wiped out for the project to die. A bus factor of one means if I get hit by a bus, uh, we're done. So in terms of sustainability, which is a big theme for BHL, uh, this is about as bad as it gets. And the other thing about this project is it requires there to be existing data on articles. I need titles, journals, volumes, pages. If I've got that, I can go find articles. Now, those of you who are familiar with BHL may be wondering why I'm going on about there are no articles in BHL, because if you go there and click on this little tab called Table of Contents, in many cases, you'll actually find articles. And the reason for that is the articles that I find in Biostore go into BHL. There are also some other projects, there are quite a few people in BHL doing this. So over the last sort of decade, we've been desperately trying to add as many articles as we can. And if we're successful, you'll see something with a table of contents. If there's no table of contents there, or it's more or less empty, we're sort of failed, and we're still trying to work on that. Once we've got these articles, we want to make them easy for researchers to find. And one way to do this is to add DOIs to them. So if you're an academic, and I'm guessing most people in the room probably are, you're probably very familiar with DOIs, these little magic codes for publications. What we're trying to do is to give these DOIs, which are very common in modern publications, we want to add them to the older literature or the sometimes more obscure literature in BHL. Now this is kind of, I think it's a useful thing to do for the academic community. It's also quite good for BHL because it gives us a way to measure the sort of progress and impact that we're making. So there's a group of us headed by Nicole, who you hear about uh, later on today. We have minted over the last three or four years about 34,500 DOIs. These are articles that exist in BHL that do not have DOIs anywhere else. So they're the articles that we sort of extracted and made available. 
one of the really neat things is once you do that, these things get picked up and they get cited. So there's a really good chance you could be reading a publication, a modern publication, and a list of references. It used to be the case if there's an obscure paper, you have to go Google it. Now there's going to be a link. In fact, there are something like 54,000 links that have been added because of this work in BHL. And what's really kind of cool, we didn't have to do anything to do this. This just happens automatically. Once you do that, that happens by magic. It's like passive income. It's just great. The other thing we can do is if you have DOIs that aren't, <coughs> excuse me, aren't BHL DOIs, but exist for publishers, we may have a free version of that article in BHL. There's a tool called Unpaywall that basically says, here's a DOI. If it's behind, an uh, behind a paywall, so you can't read it without getting out your credit card, we can look on the internet and find you a legal copy. So it's kind of like Sci-Hub if you're a bit of a scaredy cat. And something like nearly 42,000 articles that are otherwise behind a paywall are made freely available by BHL. So we can sort of measure the impact by having and making things accessible. Okay, so articles are wonderful. Uh, how do we get them faster? Otherwise, how do we can sort of extract these more quickly? We've got about a quarter of a million, actually a bit, bit over a quarter of a million now. How can we improve that? So I've been really interested in exploring um, the possibilities of AI. Uh, here's one really early experiment. So the idea here is we could use some tools to kind of classify a scanned image of a page. In this case, this looks like the start of a page in an article. We try and score it. This particular approach isn't terribly successful. I guess the idea here is if you looked at any paper and just sort of squinted, you could probably guess, is that the start of a paper or is that the end of the paper or is it the middle? This is what this is trying to do. That was moderately successful. Uh, Mike Trinsner, I think Mike's at the Smithsonian, has come up with a, a nice kind of tool that enables you to classify images. Basically say, here's an image and you ask the AI tool, I've got three or four different possibilities, pick the best one, this seems kind of fun. But the one that I've had the most success with is, of course, ChatGPT. So what you can do with ChatGPT is essentially the following. So I go and get a scanned volume in VHL. I find the table of contents. I send it off to ChatGPT. And I say, OK, uh, from the table of contents, can you give me the titles and the pages of those articles? And I get that back. And I say, OK, I'm going to go and look in the rest of the BHL text on those pages and check that the title is actually real. And if it is actually that title, I then say, okay, ChatGPT, you told me this page is a start of an article, give me the information. And I want to do it in a way that I can read on a computer. So I get back some information in a format. This is one particular format that I use in the Biostore tool. So how does that work? So essentially back to my French journal on frogs, this is the table of contents. On the right-hand side is the OCR text. It's not too bad, it doesn't have to be perfect. I send it off to ChatGPT. The little bit there in blue is what's called the prompt. So I'm basically saying, this is the table of contents. Please get me a bunch of information. The rest of it on the left is the OCR text. There are some weird characters and stuff. It doesn't really matter. ChatGPT is pretty good. And it gives me back this. And if you're a programmer, this is wonderful. It might not be terribly readable, but this is structural information which I can then go and use. And I'm off to the races. I can then go and find these blocks of text in BHL that correspond to articles. And so far, this has been pretty successful. So if you go to BHL now and look at this journal Alites, which is a fairly modern, uh, really interesting journal on frogs, almost all the articles in there have been found using ChatGPT and have been added in the last couple of weeks. Now, there are still some other kind of obstacles. Um, there are lots of articles that people care about that are not in BHL for all sorts of reasons. Uh, this next slide, I kind of regret making this slide. This is one of those diagrams that's going to take about half an hour to explain. But <laughs> what I'm trying to capture here is, so BHL has been around for a little while. And what you're seeing here is, this is the start of BHL. This is the present day. Each one of these rows represents a major partner in BHL that's doing scanning. This is the USDA, which is about a third of BHL content. And this is COVID along here. And what you sort of see is lots of organizations joined BHL, pumped in a lot of content, and they kind of seem to like fade off dramatically. Here's the Smithsonian, doing pretty well. But most of the sort of participants in this project kind of faded away. Uh, Nicole will kill me if I don't mention BHL Australia is doing very well. There's the AMNH in New York. And hiding behind the USDA is the Paris Museum. 
So there is an issue here with the sort of amount of data being contributed. It seems to have kind of fallen off. And if we want all the articles, B and BHO, then hopefully we need to prod some of these people. Okay. Now we sort of want to finish up with uh, what do we do with these articles? So I spent a lot of time trying to find them. Uh, and there's other things you might want to do. And we've seen, for example, Dima talking about finding names in the articles. Uh, I want to sort of finish with a slightly cautionary tale where I sort of got carried away, was very proud of myself, and then got slapped down um, for a very good reason. So I have a sort of running hate, love hate relationship with BHL in that for many people, BHL is these wonderful kind of sepia toned images of organisms. And they look pretty, but they look old. And so what you're seeing here is an attempt to clean up an image. On the left-hand side, this is a mosquito uh, diagram. There's lots of kind of sepia tones and sort of things going on. It's a bit hard to see. Uh, you possibly can't see it, but there are some very faint lines there, which are text from the other page you can sort of see through. On the right-hand side is the same image cleaned up, black and white, it's clearer, we've lost the text coming through. And it's also, this image file is much, much smaller. So I'm using some techniques that Google developed for Google Books. So you go from these really big images, the actual PDFs are gigantic, to something much kind of cleaner and crisper. I was very pleased with this. I blogged about it. I've got uh, a DOI for that blog. And I was very excited and sort of put this up. And then uh, I got some feedback. This is Peter Utz, who is, I think he's actually a protein biochemist. And in his quote unquote spare time, uh, runs a database on reptiles. And his response was, well, gee, I don't care what color the images are. I just want to be able to find them. And you fix that. And this makes seem as a slightly odd comment to make in a way, because many people in the BHL community, there's this extraordinary resource for these images on Flickr, which is searchable and you can find things. Again, they are the pretty, the sepia tones, the kind of old fashioned, it's, it's a glorious resource. But I think Peter is after much more sort of specific, scientifically useful kind of information. So to give a sense of what I think he's after, this is a little toy that I put together. It's based on um, sort of a similar but different project to BHO. Some of you may be aware of a project called Plasi, which is kind of a little bit like BHO, but tends to deal with, uh, I don't want to say more recent literature, but it deals with literature that's been published, open access, as born digital, nice, clean, crisp, modern PDFs. And if you do that, you can pull out images. So what I've done here is I've combined uh, images from this project, Plasi project. You can see evolutionary trees, habitats, drawings, and so on, with a classification from the Catalog of Life. And you can basically click up and down here and view available images for any one of these species uh, of reptiles. Now, you can do this for the Plasi database. I think it'd be awesome if we could do something similar for BHL. So we could find not just the pretty images, the glorious kind of pictures and so on, but all the diagrams, the distribution maps, evolutionary trees, specimens, habitats, diagrams of genitalia of whatever animal you're interested in and so on. So I think that's sort of one direction we could kind of think about. Okay, now let me try and summarize this. So what's next? So I want to get many more articles. So if we think of what? 61 million pages in the BHO book. It's a roughly 10 pages per article. There are what, 6 million, give or take, articles to find. And we've got a bit over a quarter of a million, a lot to do. So we need to scale up, 10X that thing. Uh, now short of, if anybody knows where to buy these, please tell me. Um, <laughs> so short of doing that, then I think we need to be a bit cleverer. I think there's a lot of potential here with AI, uh, both the sort of image classification, but also chat GPT. I think is potentially really kind of useful. Maybe we can then use that to generate uh, articles a lot more effectively. And I guess the final thing is to think about um, BHL is an extraordinary project that generates some really wonderful things. Uh, I think sometimes we tend to lose a little bit of sight about what actual researchers want. So when Peter came along and said, I don't care what the images look like, I just want to be able to find them, I thought it was quite kind of sobering. And I think there's a lot of potential to actually produce these articles in, in forms and sort of ways that researchers can actually find useful. Thanks very much for your time. Hey, 
Thank you, Kay and Dima and Rod. So now we have time for questions. Martin has a microphone. Okay, there are none in the room. Are there any questions on Zoom? I have one question. I think it's for a second speaker. It seems that in developing and evaluating the names indexing, you have compiled useful training data that others could use. Will this be an output of the project as well as the name indexing code itself? Uh, everything that we do is open source. Uh, the data that we have, uh, so first of all, if you have a laptop, you can do it yourself. Um, because, you know, uh, open data, uh, BHL is open. Uh, all our scripts uh, are open. So, but uh, other than that, uh, we have, uh, uh, like, for example, for the data that we did with Jeff, uh, we have not only um, open uh, program that can do it, but we also have a database of people who are interested to query uh, in bulk what we have, they can do it. So we do try. If something is missing, let us know. We will do it. I have another online question. This one says, the bus factor is quite a concern. If BHL is dependent on Biostore, is there potential to open up the project and build a community of developers to take it forward? I, I, I guess the answer is I would like to think yes. Um, the only real impediment to that is my laziness in, in some respects. Um, there's a few other things that would happen, but yes, it, it is a worrying dependency, um, certainly going ahead for the future of BHL. Any other questions? Um, I, I have a question for Kay about the plant stud book, and I was just wondering how prevalent is that in the whole botanic industry at large? It's not that prevalent yet, but there are um, global consortia for particular groups of species like oaks, maples, magnolias, cycads, and um, we're working with them right now to start adopting the stud book for all of the tax that they manage. Um, this is a, a comment, I guess an addendum rod. I would say those images you were adjusting, I appreciate Peter's perspective as a researcher. There are other constituencies and potential users of this data. And I think those ones where you've tweaked the image and removed the yellow, et cetera, have great potential for some other types of uses and perhaps also enhanced discoverability once you've taken all the noise out. So I appreciate your work on that. Thank you. I have another online question. Uh, Dima mentioned that there are a large number of names in BHL that have not been found for a variety of reasons. Is there a sense of how many false positives currently exist in BHL? Uh, we try to keep it uh, lower. So when we in doubt, we tend to not to include it into the list. Um, I, so I would say uh, current algorithm does not create many, maybe less than 1%. Uh, but we would like uh, to create a lot of false positives uh, in our next effort and then remove them when we uh, go through the sort of second stage. So that, that's our idea. Another question came in online. What does the future of BHL look like with respect to funding or lack thereof? That's something to be determined, and we are working on that as we move forward. So we are hoping to um, have answers for that in the coming periods of time. Okay, another question just came in. Uh, to Dima and Rod, do you think the uncertain AI predictions generated by both of your models could feed into some sort of crowdsourcing effort?
I guess obviously inevitably the answer is going to be yes. Um, we, there's been a lot of think, thoughts going on about the idea of crowdsourcing bibliographic information that we could then use to feed in to find these articles. And I'm sure Dima will have comments on crowdsourcing names. Uh, I would say um, because of the uh, very large um, uh, volume that we work, um, we, uh, I think the best crowdsourcing would be um, sort of um, down up, right? Something is right, something is not. Like if we will be able to get this as a crowdsourcing, it will help tremendously. Um, I have a sort of a follow-up question for Dima, I think, about the names. Um, you've said that there are a number of names that haven't been found for a variety of reasons, but that is for the names index, but are they not in fact findable by a full text search through the OCR text? So they are findable, just not through this the, the computer computerized approach. So might there not, in fact, be a way to tag or otherwise identify, um, put in some kind of a mechanism where someone's searching for a particular species and finding it through full text might add it to the index? Very, very, very good uh, comment. Uh, I, I think it would be wonderful. Um, and definitely, uh, like when we do elastic search, when we do full text, uh, it can be, uh, it can find something that we missed. Uh, and if somebody says, ah, oh, you have a name, like, so practically um, it would be easy, uh, how easy it is, right? If you need to fill out a form, if you need to log in and so on and so on, then uh, a number of feedback will be very small. If it is like very easy uh, in a interface, then yes. And uh, uh, we we are talking about uh, applying two grants, and one grant is um, about um, this kind of interfaces. So to make it possible in Beijing. Um, and I'd like to dream big on that, Dima, so that we can take that sort of idea moving forward and then apply the same idea to like people names and place names in the giant corpus to do the same thing, yeah? Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll have a 15 minute break and come back for the second session. Thank you so much. My knees frozen. <laughs> started once again. Hope you're feeling refreshed. Uh, my name is Gretchen Rings. I'm the museum librarian here at the Field Museum and one of the co-hosts of this year's conference or meeting. And I am pleased to pre uh, pleased to introduce my colleague, Anderson Fajot, Assistant Curator of Mammals here at the Field Museum. And as uh, we did in the first half, we'll wait to do questions at the very end. Hi, everyone. It's a very pleasure to be here today and participate in this amazing event, get to know so many different topics and kind of research and what we can do with the BHL, which is a very privilege to be here. So today I have the honor to talk a little about my research before 
moved to Chicago, I was working in China for seven years. So I developed a lot of projects related to the Tibetan plateau and how animals can adapt it to high altitudes. So today I'm gonna to present a little about some of this research. But before that, I found appropriate to introduce a little about the subjects that I'm gonna talk by starting to tell what are pikas. So it's very common that people come to me associating pikas with guinea pig or hamsters, which I guess they are quite overall similar, short ears, short buds. But the truth is pikas are not rodents. They're actually cousins of red and rabbits and belong to one specific order of mammals called lagomorph. So they are very interesting in many aspects. And one of them is because in history, pikas were well diversified, especially in the 20 million years ago. And we have over 30 genera of pikas recognized. But nowadays, we only have one genome that has survived and is the living representative of this amazing group. They were very common in the North Hemisphere. So we had them in Europe, we had them in Asia, in North America, even close to Illinois. But nowadays, the pikas are mainly in Asia and two species we have in North America. If you guys are familiar with the rock mountain areas, so you can find pikas there. So we have one genus with 34 species. A very interesting thing about pikas is of the 34 species, about 40% actually you can find in the Tibetan plateau, which is amazing diverse for a very limited area compared to the whole distribution of the group. They're all herbivores like the other lagomorphs and they have a very interesting uh, physiological trait. It's they are very sensitive to the warming conditions. So in areas that the temperature start to grow higher above 75 Fahrenheit, they actually population start to reduce. And if the temperature consists for over time, you actually might end up losing that population in warm areas. So because of that, PICAS has been known to be a very important climate sentinel and help us understand more and track the effects of climate change in the community. So I was mentioned that PICAS live mainly in the Tibetan plateau. And I found this map very impressive. It's a topographic map of Asia. And you can see in the core area of Asia, we have this massive block where the average altitude is about 16,000 feet. So it's the highest plateau in the world. And usually when we think about living in high mountains or those who experience uh, do some hiking, one of the common uh, challenges of survive or even visit those kind of habitats is the low oxygen or low temperature. So those are the common challenges that when we think about survive or living at high elevation, it comes to our mind. But the truth is there are many others challenge that for animals, plants to survive at so at a high elevation, they need to overcome. For example, at high elevation, we have a much higher UV radiation that at sea level, and this is related to cancer development. We also have a very short growing season. For example, in the Tibetan, uh, we have only three months where there is a growing production. The animals need to eat enough to accumulate enough food to survive through the, uh, the remaining nine months. And the pikas also have another interesting thing is they do not hibernate. So they do not have the advantage of sleeping over the harsh period of the year and come out only during the, the spring or the summertime. So they need in three months to accumulate enough food that they will consume slowly through the next nine months of the year. And they are also exposed to a very high predator at high elevation. As you can see here, it's a very grassland area, so no much place to hide. And it's funny because when we think about challenges in the high altitudes, we can actually have similar situation compared with desert, with a very short growing season and very exposure without much cover, and also with a life underground where the oxygen is also very limited. So because of that combination, that triggers to try to understand more how pikas could have such a high diversity and be able to successfully colonize and live in the Tibetan plateau. 
And we early realized we could address this question in many ways in many aspects. For example, we could explore the morphology. We could explore the ecology of the, those animals. We could also explore the genetics and physiology. And all of those will provide us different clues for this puzzle. So today, I'm gonna to present two aspects that we explore and then that we learn about pikas is, one is the functional morphology level. So the skull for mammals is a very important uh, piece of information that we can learn so much about it. We can understand the diet, we can have clues about the kind of visual adaptation, we can have clues about the hearing abilities. So because of that, we decided to study how the skull of pikas can tell us a little more about how they were able to colonize and diversify and occupy the whole area of the Tibetan plateau. So this is a complex plot, but the key point is each dot, each symbol represents one different species. And everything red are those species who live exclusively at high elevation. And most of them are exclusively found in the Tibetan plateau. The position of the plot, the position of the dot represent a different skull shape. So dots close by to each other, they will mean species have a more similar skull. Dots in extreme of the plot means they'll have a very different skull morphology. And as you can see here, at the very extreme, you have those that live in high elevation, marked as a red. So initially, we were actually expecting a very different result. We were expecting that pikas would have a more similar skull since they live in a more similar high altitude environment in a way that we expect some kind of conversion to a very similar kind of habitat. But the result told us a very different story. It shows us that actually those who live in the high altitudes evolve a very different skull uh, morphology that kind of reflects the habitat they live. So when we look into um, a little more about recollage and their distribution, we start to realize that those extreme pikas with very different skulls, they actually live in kind of different habitats in the Tibetan plateau, even though at the superficial level, they look very similar grassland uh, kind of environment. But when we look deeper where they, they make the burrows, where they make the nests, we start to realize the real kind of dissimilarity in those species. So for example, this Thomas pika lives in a very rock soil. And they, it has the most flattened skull among the whole genus. And when we start to look for association between rock soils, burrowing, and skull morphology, we start to realize other groups of uh, vertebrates also have a very similar way to survive in this kind of rock environment. So for example, these lizard also have a very, very flat skull that allow it to get in the small gravits among the rocks. So put together all of this information, we start to realize that even though the plateau leaves seem similar in a, in a overview way, when we look deep into the kind of microhabitat those spikers leaves, we start to realize they come out with very distinct a way to adapt it to this kind of uh, specific habitats in a way to be very good in exploring the research and reduce the competition with others that might not be as successful as those that live in this kind of environment. So that start to provide us some clues about how pikas could uh, live in and succeed and colonize different aspects of the Tibetan plateau. But still, we were curious about the different questions. We were curious about asking how those pikas who live in the Tibetan compared to those pikas who did not live in the Tibetan and live more at the middle elevation, how different they were. And we answer this question by looking to the genetic adaptations. So for that, we compare two species of pikas, one endemic of the Tibetan plateau and another more in the middle elevation at the border of the plateau, about uh, 10,000 feet. And we were curious to detect the different expression levels of genes in different organs to see if you can relate to, to, to specifically function that we can relate it to different 
uh, altitude and different habitat. So a very interesting result that we found are that pikas that live in the Tibetan, they have several genes that are overexpressed that allow them to cope with those extractures. For example, we detect several genes related with DNA repair and immunoregulation that has been associated with a better way to deal with the UV light and reduce the possibility of cancer development. We also detect genes that allow a different pathways of metabolism to develop the function without relying too much on oxygen. Again, a different way to, to deal with the low oxygen at a high altitude. So putting together all these pieces, we now have different groups working on their morphology, try to understand for those species who do overlap in distribution, how do they survive and how do they compete for the limited research? And so far we have found that those species who actually overlap, they have a distinct way to explore the habitat. For example, some might become diurnal, while others become nocturnal, even though in other areas where they do not overlap, they have a similar activity part. So all of these are very interesting and give us a better idea of how they can survive at high elevation. But why all of this is important? With the climate change, there is a very common pattern that we're seeing with mountain animals, mountain plants, is they're moving up slope to be able to track a better climate condition when the lower elevation get warm. So by understanding what kind of adaptation the animals need to cope, need to develop to survive higher elevation, we might be able to have clues to understand what will be the fate for those middle elevation population and how far they could go without have so much genes related, so much morphology related. So the idea is with this project, now we are moving to the next step, is to better understand what will be the fate for the mountain population in the next century, consider the fate, the rate that the warming is happening now. And I wanted to end this presentation by highlight, since we are in the VHL symposium, I am from Brazil originally, and I'm from a small state, so we did not have big libraries, especially with historical books. And during the first phase of my underground, I used to send emails to other friends in bigger states in Brazil and ask them to go to their library and take pictures of the book that I need to use. And these could take like one month, two months, because they were busy and a lot of requests, or I could just forget about this book and do not have access to their reference. But with the BHL organization and effort to make all of these historical books and recent literature available, everyone now have access to this important information. So this is the first line of the acknowledgement of my main paper for my dissertation, where I feel obligated to acknowledge the importance of the BHL to the development of this project. So I want to thank you all for all your work on this and effort to make this information. You have no idea how, or you have idea, but being from, being from a place where you do not have this research is a very game change for us to be able to access all of those. And with that, I thank you all. And I just want to mention that all of this project were also thanks to an amazing team of my Chinese colleagues and students who were involved. So I will be happy to ask any question after the talks. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to invite my colleague Maureen Turcatel to the front. Um, there she is. Uh, and Maureen is a collections manager here at the Field Museum. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I'm Maureen Turcatel. I'm the collections manager of insects here at the Field Museum. I love to brag that it's the largest collection of the museum. And I'm very happy to be here this afternoon to talk to you a little bit about my research and the work that we do here in the collections. 
So the horseflies belong to the family Tabanidae, and we have about 4,400, 4, 4,500 uh, species described. So that makes them um, the largest uh, family of blood-sucking insects. Uh, they are found pretty much everywhere with a few exceptions. Uh, so they're not reported, of course, uh, in um, the Arctic and Antarctica, also not in Hawaii, Greenland, and Iceland. Um, and uh, they are very known because of their painful bite. So the females feed on blood um, because they need the, the uh, protein in blood for maturing their eggs and can also be a um, vector of some uh, bloodborne diseases. But even though this is the most uh, um, known behavior of horseflies, the males can actually be important pollinators as they feed on um, nectar and pollen. Uh, and some females also will feed on nectar and pollen just for uh, carbs, just like all of us here. Um, yeah, so that's just to illustrate uh, why their bites are so painful. So they have these very strong mouth parts. Uh, the mandibles are really sharp and they use those mandibles. It, they do kind of like a side to side and downward uh, motion to slash the skin. And then they have some anticoagulants in their saliva. So they add that saliva to the mix to get the blood flowing. And then after we have a pool of blood laying on top of the skin, they lap that blood with the softer part of their mouth, which is uh, the labella. Uh, so that's very different from, from a mosquito, for example. Mosquitoes are much nicer. They, it looks like a hypodermic needle. They go directly for the capillaries. Uh, and in addition to the anticoagulants, they have anesthetics. So that's why you only notice them after they, they go away. The horsefly, you notice the moment that they are biting you. Uh, and they use a mixture of um, visual and chemical cues to find their host. So they're going to detect plumes of carbon dioxide uh, from the uh, respiration. Um, and uh, there's still some, some debate uh, if they are attracted to darker colors or if it's polarized light but they seem to be attracted to darker colors. So that's why people usually say that when they go out in the summer near water, if you have lighter colors, it's better. Uh, some of the deer flies, they really like the field museum blue for some reason. Uh, so that's usually what I, what I tell people, stick with light colors because somehow that works. Uh, and the male and the females are very easy to tell apart. Now, when we look in the collections, usually we see females because that's our, the, the, the ones that are easier to collect. Uh, but you tell them apart by looking at their face. So the females, they are dicoptic, so they have that space between the eyes. Uh, and the males are holoptic, so there's no space um, between the eyes. Uh, these pictures right here, uh, these are very special for me because that's the species that I described during my master's. Uh, they belong to the genus Stibosoma, uh, which are some horse flies that uh, are found in the canopy of the Amazonian forest. And uh, I think they're really cute. They uh, resemble bumblebees. Uh, and horseflies, usually they are not host specific. So they will feed on blood of pretty much um, any mammal. Um, but we do have some species that are reported to feed on non-mammal hosts, uh, such as um, this endemic horse of the Amazon, uh, Betrachia ocellata. Uh, it is reported to feed only on caiman crocodiles even when other hosts are around. So usually it goes, it's circle in there. Um, it bites right above the eye where the skin's a little bit thinner. Um, and we also have another species, uh, Stenotabanus cretatus, which is also from the Amazon that is uh, recorded feeding on um, caimans and anacondas. And we also have three genera, at least, of non-blood feeding horse flies. So this is one of them, Sepsis appendiculata, uh, that's also from Brazil, and we have two other genera uh, from the eastern coast of Africa. They have very reduced mouth parts and some unusual uh, morphology. So there's still no consensus of um, where we should place this group phylogenetically. Uh, we don't know if they, they share some of these uh, morphological uh, characters, but there's we still don't know if they are convergent. Uh, and also, we don't even know if these flies feed as adults at all. Okay, 
Uh, and talking about morphology, we have three uh, traditional subfamilies, it, and it's uh, based mostly on morphology. So we have the pangonini, which are the long tongue horseflies, um, the tabonini, which are the big horseflies, and the chrysopsini, uh, which are mostly the deer flies. This was the first publication using molecular data for horseflies, uh, and the family was well supported as monophyletic. And then later, we had a more comprehensive paper uh, by Morita and collaborators, which investigated the relationships of those subfamilies. And they found out that only two of the subfamilies, Pangonini and Tabonini, uh, were supported as monophyletic. Um, this is a divergence time estimation uh, for the. It is calibrated with the oldest horsefly fossil, which is um, Eotabanoid urdi, uh, which is 142 million years old. So a significant part of the diversification that we see here for horseflies, uh, they coincide with the Paleocene-Eocene radiation, which resulted in the uh, major lineages of modern mammals. So this might suggest that they switch their preferences from small mammals to large mammals, um, or even that the earlier lineages of horseflies were feeding on other vertebrates, just like those ones that I was uh, showing that still show that uh, behavior. And the subfamily Chrysopsini was the focus of my PhD research. So we have uh, three tribes. Um, I used molecular data on for, for my PhD, and there's still a lot of work to be done that was not resolved at all. Uh, of course, I picked the most complicated subfamily. So I'm still working on that. Uh, at the time, I used traditional Sanger uh, methodology. So now we are uh, really hopeful that phylogenetic, phylogenetic, phylogenomic methods uh, are going to help us to elucidate uh, these relationships. Uh, and that's what I'm working uh, on right now. So I'm currently running the bioinformatics pipeline to assemble the whole genome of a horsefly. So this is going to be the first uh, within the superfamily tabenomorpha. And I am also uh, testing using ultra-conserved elements. I will test a probe set that was designed for uh, Ostroida, which is another group of, of um, flies, um, because we still don't have a specific probe for horseflies. Uh, so I'll try this one, and if it works, it will also uh, show how, how the methodology can be um, you know, um, applied to uh, several groups um, in the same order. Uh, oh, yes, and here's just highlighting. Uh, I mentioned that the, the genome is going to be the first within the superfamily, the, uh, the panomorpha. So most of the genomes that we have available for flies, they are positioned in these two uh, extremes of the um, diptera tree of life. Uh, so there's this big gap in the middle. So this information uh, will help us understand uh, the evolutionary history of flies in general. Uh, for the genomic studies, I need fresh horseflies, so I also do some field work to collect them. Uh, horseflies, unfortunately, don't do very well in lab, so we cannot rear them. Uh, so usually what I do, uh, this is one of the methods that I use. It's a malaise trap, so this one is six meters. I have no idea how much that is in feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and usually they have collecting jars uh, at the top, uh, so it's it, it's a dark net. And when insects are trapped, usually they have a tendency to go up towards the light. So at both sides, we have a collecting jar. Uh, we can fill them with alcohol. In my case, I like to block them and then catch them with my hand net because I like to preserve them in liquid nitrogen, which is the gold standard for uh, genomic work. And more recently, my colleague Jim Lauderman and I developed the Jeep method. We are not sponsored. <laughs> he just happens to have a Jeep. Uh, so what happened was when we went to the field several times, we started driving. We noticed that the horse flies would come towards us. But as soon as we stepped out of the car, they would go away. So uh -oh. here's what we came up with. <laughs> Jim drives his jeep very slowly, and I walk behind it and catch the horse flies, <laughs> and it works. This day, uh, we were in Michigan at the Warren Woods um, Ecological um, Preserve, and we were in the field for about 45 minutes or so, and we were able to find seven different species, um, and that was just last summer. 
and it's it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Sorry, how, there you go. Oh, and in addition to Michigan, last year, I also spent a month collecting in the north of Madagascar. And this year I have some field work planned for um, Panama in July and uh, Brazil in November. And then after the, the flies are captured, I put them in a pre-labeled cryo vial. Um, usually I just have a, a lunch box with some ice. Uh, and I put them there until I come back to my field station or the hotel. Uh, I have to ID the fly alive, so the ice is nice because they have a cold induced nap. Uh, but I did have some horseflies flying in the hotel room while I was trying to do that, <laughs> but I managed to get them back. Uh, after the ID, I enter all the information into my spreadsheets, in spreadsheets, put them back in the vial, uh, and then it goes directly into liquid nitrogen. Um, Oh, what did I do? I am so sorry. Yes, and then they go after uh, that, they, they go into cryogenic storage. So this is a picture of our current um, facility here at the Field Museum. Uh, we have six liquid nitrogen vessels, We and um, we are moving them soon uh, to a new facility in the summer. So we're really exciting about that. And talking about managing collections, that's a big part of what I do here. Uh, so that's my main responsibility to manage the insects collection, which also comprises the arachnids and myriapods. Uh, and this is the fifth um, largest insect collection in North America. So we estimate that we have about 13 million specimens. That includes uh, 5 million pin specimens, maybe half a million uh, specimens in microscope slides, um, 8.5 million wet specimens, which is a really hard task to count them because sometimes we have jars with multiple specimens that count as one. So that's what we call them bulk samples. We count uh, around 20,000 of them, but they are just residues from um, traps, um, mainly my flight intercept traps, could be malaise traps. Uh, and yeah, and that's, it could be hundreds, thousands of, of bugs in a jar, but still it counts as one. Uh, this is a screenshot of our data set on GBIF. Uh, we have about 3% of our collection digitized. So our dig digitization efforts started uh, in the 1980s, documenting the biodiversity data from our bulk samples. And uh, since then, we had several grants from the National Science Foundation. One of them is the, is the uh, Terrestrial Parasite Tracker Project, which is a collaborating effort of 26 uh, institutions. And it's a very ambitious goal of digitizing 1.2 million arthropod specimens. Um, we are focusing mainly on our slide collections. Oh, sorry. Ah, there you go. We are focusing mainly on our um, microscope slides collection, especially the Lewis Flea collection and the Loomis Mite collection. And uh, to tackle the transcription, uh, we are imaging the slides uh, in house. And then for transcribing the, the slides, we partnered with Notes from Nature, which is an online platform and volunteers anywhere, if they have a computer and access to the internet, they can help us transcribe the label data. So this is a, a really nice um, citizen community um, collaborative uh, and, you know, um, project. It's, and it's it's been really rewarding to see people from all around the world coming in and helping us with that. Uh, as a collections manager, I also participate in outreach events and uh, public programs here at the museum. Here we have some uh, pictures of the Granger Science Hub, uh, which is a space dedicated for showcasing our collections. Uh, we have weekly meet a scientist events where we can just stay there and answer any questions and talk to the public. Uh, I also collaborate with the um, exhibits department um, a couple of years ago, we developed a traveling exhibit called Wild Color. We, it was uh, on display here at the Field Museum until 2023, and then it moved to Denver. And more recently, we opened uh, Bloodsuckers uh, from Legends to Liches, which was developed by the Royal Ontario Museum. And I served as content advisor, um, helping to adapt uh, the information to the American public, 
and also to add some uh, field museum uh, specific content. So I think that is almost my time. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation. And um, we'll, if you have any questions later, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. It's my pleasure to um, introduce our next speaker, Siobhan Leishman. She is chair of the DHL Wiki Working Group. Kia ora koutou katoa, ko Siobhan Leishman toko ingoa, no Cleethorpes me Melbourne uh, o ko tipuna, ke te noho ao ke te whanganui atara. Okay, let's try this way. Yeah, that works. Um, so that was my mihi, my introduction in Te Reo Māori, the Indigenous language of New Zealand. Um, I've greeted you as a group. I told you my name, Siobhan Leachman, told you where my ancestors came from, Cleethorpes in the UK and Melbourne, Australia, and I've explained where I currently live, which is Wellington, New Zealand. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the Indigenous tribes upon whose ancestral lands I now stand and pay my respects to their elders. I'd also like to thank the symposium organizers for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm delighted because I very much appreciate the work that all Biodiversity Heritage Library contributors do, and particularly the partners and affiliates, because it's an amazing resource. So I'm a wiki editor. I edit English Wikipedia, I edit the image repository Wiki Commons and also the data repository Wikidata. And I tend to call these collective projects um, the Wikiverse. And today I'm intending to highlight just a few of the ways that the Biodiversity Heritage Library has been used to improve these Wiki projects. I'm aiming to give examples of how BHL has inspired Wiki editors to show how BHL content can be used and have a wider impact. And finally, to give an example of how BHL itself can benefit from the Wikiverse. I'm wanting to emphasise that as a result of working together, the Biodiversity Heritage Library and the Wiki communities provide everyone with greater access to biodiversity knowledge. Now, one of the most common ways BHL helps the Wikiverse is providing access to published books and scholarly articles. And these are used by wiki editors to provide references that support statements being made in Wikipedia articles. But BHL contains so much more than just formally published material. It also contains digitized handwritten field notebooks, catalogues, letters, all of which hold really important biodiversity related knowledge. And it's this type of content that can be used by wiki editors and can also inspire them to contribute to the Wikiverse. So take this example. This is a Smithsonian herbarium catalogue. It was written by the botanist Joseph Nelson Rose in the early 1900s. Now Joseph was listing specimens being sent to the United States National Herbarium and he was including in his catalogue information on who collected the specimens and the locations they were found. And this particular catalogue inspired me as a Wikipedia editor to write articles because it is chock full of women botanists, all of whom were sending specimens to him. And it was through this catalogue that I became aware of the botanist Rose E. Collum. Now, the catalogue inspired me to research and write a Wikipedia article about her. Now, Mrs. Collum was the most amazing botanist and botanical collector. In fact, she's the first paid botanist working in the Grand Canyon National Park. And this is an example of where the Biodiversity Heritage Library can inspire wiki editors by giving access to documents that might not otherwise be accessible to them. 
Now, many of these important handwritten texts are placed into BHL as a result of partner institutions like, say, the Field Museum or the Smithsonian digitizing them. But because these texts are handwritten, the optical character recognition or OCR generated from these te texts are often not very useful. And this means despite the text now being accessible via BHL, the biodiversity knowledge contained in them is actually really difficult to extract. But BHL affiliates and partner organizations not only digitize these resources, some of them run or donate their content to transcription platforms. And this is where citizen scientists and volunteers help transcribe these texts to get basically the text into a machine readable form. Now, BHL is currently working with these partner organizations to get access to these transcriptions so that they can be added to BHL, replacing the useless OCR and making the information in these texts much more accessible for everyone, including Wikipedians. And this is important because having handwritten handwriting transformed to machine readable text ensures the biodiversity knowledge in BHL can much more easily be searched for and be found. And once the knowledge is found, it can be reused. And in particular, I and other wiki editors are really keen to use this knowledge in Wikipedia, Wikidata and Wikicommons. Now I want to give an example of how when you reuse BHL content in the Wikiverse, it can have a much greater than anticipated impact. Take this hand-painted illustration of a banded kokapu by Joseph Dryton. Now this beautiful image was created by Dryton when he visited New Zealand with the United States Exploring Expedition in around 1840. It's an illustration of an, an endemic fish caught in a stream near Mr. Tibby's Hotel in the Bay of Islands, and that's in the north of New Zealand. The original is held at the Smithsonian Library and Archives. It was digitized by them, and it was placed in BHL. And when I saw that illustration, I immediately thought, that's out of copyright. I can upload it into Wikicommons. And once it's in Wikicommons, I could then use it in the species Wikipedia article. So you can see that BHL, its partners and affiliates are helping provide content that automatically, as soon as people do things with it, improves that Wikipedia article. But by sharing this BHL content on Wikipedia, it can have a larger than anticipated impact. And I personally discovered this because not long after uploading that image into that Wikipedia article, I went to my local school fair. And at that school fair, the New Zealand Department of Conservation had a stall, and they were handing out pamphlets on how to improve water quality of local streams in my local area. And front and centre on that pamphlet was that gorgeous fish image, sourced from the Wikipedia article. So the Biodiversity Heritage Library is directly impacting conservation efforts in my local neighbourhood, half a world away from where that original painting is held. And this impact is happening because this illustration was digitized by the Smithsonian, placed in BHL, and put in Wikipedia. Now, you don't have to trawl through the millions of BHL pages to find more of these beautiful scientific illustrations, because BHL has made it easy to find these glorious images. BHL partners and affiliates have uploaded over 300,000 of them into the Flickr website. And to help make these illustrations more findable, BHL's actually asked volunteers to tag these images with things like species name tags, as well as name, uh, tags for the names of the artists. Now, there are prolific BHL Flickr taggers sitting amongst you right now. BHL volunteers like myself and also my friend Michelle Marshall, who happens to be in the room with us today, just to name two of us, have donated a lot of their time to, do, to doing this work. And these tags help describe the images in a way that both humans and machines can read. And of course, it helps people find these images on Flickr so that they can reuse them. And because these illustrations that BHL has, have uploaded into Flickr are, are all out of copyright, they can also be uploaded into Wikicommons, the Wiki image repository. 
And when uploaded into Wiki Commons, it's possible for, to get those Flickr tags to travel with those illustrations and also be uploaded into Wiki Commons, helping make the images more findable on that Wiki platform as well. Now, this Flickr tagging empowers people, including Wikipedians, to undertake research on those illustrations. So, for example, when tagging the BHL images in Flickr, Michelle and I kept coming across women scientific illustrators. So many women scientific illustrators. So we started a project researching them. Michelle would write blog posts about them, and I would start creating or enriching Wikipedia articles about them. And this, our work got the attention of BHL, who in 2019 organized a Her Natural History campaign. Now, this was a celebration of women in natural history. And as part of this campaign, a Wikipedia editathon was held to improve articles and create articles on women natural history illustrators, collectors, and scientists, acknowledging the amazing work and amazing contributions that these women make or have made. And again, this shows the benefit BHL provides the Wikiverse. BHL supports those researching biodiversity topics, empowers folk to reuse BHL content, in this case, in Wikipedia and in Wikicommons. But it isn't just a one-way street, with only BHL helping to improve the Wikiverse. The Biodiversity Heritage Library also directly benefits from wiki engagement. And I wanna just give you one example of how. So this slide shows the BHL, a, a BHL creator identifier. BHL generates an identifier for each creator in its catalog. So authors and also many illustrators will get a creator ID that will help link them, their profile in the BHL catalog to their contributions and their content in BHL. And this BHL creator ID can then be added to the Wikidata item for that author or illustrator. Now, Wikidata is like a giant data repository for the Wikiverse. Many institutions like BHL allow their identifiers to be added to Wikidata. So libraries, archives, museums, genealogical databases, to name just a few, all allow their identifiers to be added to appropriate Wikidata items. So what this means is that when a BHL creator identifier is added to that creator's Wikidata item, it's linked via that item to identifiers of other institutions. By adding the BHL creator identifier to a Wikidata item for the creator, the Wikidata item can then act as like a crosswalk between the BHL catalog and other library and archive databases. BHL can take advantage of this by downloading those other identifiers and adding them to their BHL catalog. So in this way, the Wikiverse is helping to enrich the BHL catalog, making it easier for those using BHL to find more information about those authors and illustrators. Now, both BHL and the Wikiverse have recognized how important they are to each other. BHL's published a white paper outlining its priorities when engaging with the Wikiverse, and this white paper is helping guide the work of a recently formed collaboration called the BHL Wiki Working Group. And this group aims to add more BHL content to the Wikiverse and also to ensure that BHL obtains the maximum benefit from engaging with these various Wiki projects. So in conclusion, I'm hopeful I've given you just a taste of how the symbiotic relationship between Biodiversity Heritage Library and the Wikiverse benefits both organisations. But more importantly, I hope I've helped illustrate that by working together, BHL and the Wikiverse can help expand global access to all sorts of biodiversity knowledge. So thank you, and I look forward to any questions anyone might have at the end of the session.
And this is our final session, last but not least, is Nicole Carney. She is manager of BHL Australia and chair of BHL Persistent Identifier Working Group, or PIWG. Thank you, Gretchen. Hi, everyone. It's really lovely to be here. Um, today, I have the honour of speaking to you about the Australian branch of the Biodiversity Heritage Library. I too would like to pay my respects to the First Peoples of the land on which we stand today. I would also like to acknowledge the First Peoples of every part of Australia because I run a national project and this acknowledgement is generally missing from the material that I work with. These are all illustrations that accompany the very first published descriptions of Australian species from the late 1700s and early 1800s. This is a time in our history when the animals and plants of Australia were being discovered for the first time by Europeans. The text that accompanies these illustrations very rarely contains any acknowledgement that there were already a people in Australia who had an extensive knowledge of both the biology and behaviour of these species. The, the Australian branch of the Biodiversity Heritage Library was launched in 2010 and by Ellie Wallace, who many in the room will know. It's nationally funded by the Atlas of Living Australia and we began operation with just a single organisation, Museums Victoria. Now, Museums Victoria is the largest museum organisation in the Southern Hemisphere with this impressive suite of venues, but this is our library. And I use this photograph a lot when I talk about the Biodiversity Heritage Library because for me, it really captures why the global project exists. Our library at Museum Library at Museums Victoria, like many libraries and museums and herbaria, is closed to the public, hidden away behind the scenes but behind those doors are incredible treasures. And they of course include our librarians, as well as one of Australia's largest and most significant collections of biodiversity heritage and archival materials relating to Australia and the world. One of my absolute favorite publications from that collection that we've digitized for BHL is George Shaw's The Naturalist Miscellany, which was published from 1789 to 1813. It contains the published descriptions for over a thousand species, which were sent back to London from around the world for them to describe as specimens. Now, um, because of the timing of this publication, it contains the very first published descriptions of many of Australia's most iconic species, including the very first published description of any species of kangaroo and our duck-billed platypus. I like to think of these early descriptions as these species' international debut in the literature. Most people had never even heard of a platypus, let alone seen one when this was published. And what I really love reading is the awe and the wonder and often the scepticism of these early natural historians and scientists who were struggling to fit Australia's really weird creatures into their understanding of the natural world. In 1799, George Shaw writes, of all the mammalia yet known, the platypus seems the most extraordinary. It is the perfect resemblance of the beak of a duck engrafted onto the head of a, a quadruped. And it naturally excites the idea of some deceptive preparation by artificial means. So bizarre was this creature that they questioned whether it existed. And in fact, of all of those thousand species described in, across the 24 volumes of this publication, only three of them have two images. So it was the really weird creatures that needed almost evidence and illustration to prove they were actually real. And in fact, if you go to the Natural History Museum in London and look at the specimen from which this species was described, it's been cut across the neck because they really were looking for stitches for where that beak was sewn onto the body of something like a water rat. One of the most significant items in that Museum's Victoria collection is this. It's the Zoology of New Holland, published in 1794, which is the earliest publication ever about Australian fauna. And it's also the first publication to use the word Australia. This is my fabulous team at our digitisation lab, which is based at Melbourne Museum. We have a single scanner and a single technician. So Jack Eastor is our digitisation technician. We also have Marina Hart, who's our BHL data officer. Together they work full time. So three days for Jack, two days for Marina. So that is us. We also have this incredible team of volunteers who do some of our scanning, the majority of our cropping and post-processing and the majority of our metadata addition. I wear two hats. I manage the Australian branch of the Biodiversity Heritage Library two days, three days a week, um, and I work on the global project to make the content on BHL more discoverable the other two days. When I joined the project in 2014, we'd been joined by three other museums, all located in the southeastern part of Australia, and all focusing, as far as biodiversity was concerned, on zoology and paleontology. So what struck me when I first joined was that we were missing plants, we were missing most of the country, and we were really focused on large publicly funded institutions. 
So I wanted to increase the breadth of this project, both geographically, taxonomically, and organisationally. I wanted to know what the biodiversity knowledge of smaller organisations. So since 2014, we've grown considerably. So BHL Australia is now a truly national consortium with 50 organisations contributing their biodiversity heritage. These organisations include every one of our natural history, state and territory natural history museums and herbaria, our royal societies, universities, state libraries, field naturalist clubs, and many natural history publishers. So my desk often looks like this. We have materials sent to us from all across the country for us to digitise at our digitisation lab at the Melbourne Museum. Most of what we receive by post are journals and serials. Organisations are not usually terribly comfortable putting their rare and fragile material in the post. Um, but some, we're really proud to make this journal material available online. Some of it is not available anywhere else on the web, and some of it is quite old. So this, for example, is the 1851 first volume of the Australian Museum Memoirs. Some of our organisations elect to personally deliver to material to us. I get to have coffee with all sorts of lovely librarians who carry their material to us on the plane very carefully in their hand luggage. Other organisations send it to us by a professional art courier. So this is a beautiful collection of ornithological field diaries and correspondence, which we're in the process of transcribing. Um, they send it to us by a professional art courier. We've digitised it and sent it back using the same courier. A few of our organisations have their own digitisation facilities because they're quite well resourced. So this is the State Library of New South Wales and their lovely librarians. They've digitised some incredible treasures from their collection and sent us the digital files for us to upload online. So this is one of the, their incredible treasures. Um, this is John Lewin's The Birds of New South Wales, published in 1813. It is the very first illustrated book ever to be published in Australia. And only 13 copies of that first edition survive worldwide. That beautiful bird is now known as Lewin's Honey Eater in honour of the author, John Lewin. Unlike the State Library of New South Wales, most of our contributing organisations do not have a digitisation facility, at least for literature. So our Royal Botanic Gardens has, or their state herbarium, has a digitisation facility for specimens, but not for literature. Um, in order to digitise their um, rare and fragile material, we could do this because we were in their home state. We moved our entire digitisation operation, our staff, volunteers and our equipment across the city. We had a summer sabbatical at the gardens. We spent four months there digitising many of the beautiful rare journals from their collection, um, as well as some amazing books. This is the oldest volume that we've ever contributed to BHL from an Australian collection. It's a voyage to New Holland in the year 1699. I was very excited about this because I can now say we've digitised material from the 1600s um, all the way through to the current day. Uh, this is a particularly significant publication in its own right because it is the earliest publication in the world to include illustrations of Australian plants. But we don't just digitise and upload old stuff. We also upload very, very recently public, um, published publications. So this publication was published last week. They sent it to us. We uploaded it over the weekend and it arrived on BHL this morning. Sorry, this morning, Monday morning. Sorry, I don't know what day it is. It's Australia. Um, so the Castle Maine Naturalist is one of our most recent contributors who've joined us as part of a really exciting new project. Uh, so late last year, we received a public history grant um, from the Public Record Office of Victoria, which, would, which allows people to pre record, preserve and share the local history of our home state of Victoria. So the grant was entitled Capturing the History of Victoria's Field Naturalist Clubs. In preparation for this grant, I wrote to all the regional field naturalist clubs in our home state of Victoria, and I received eight letters of support back from those organisations, and we've been working with them throughout this year. In my grant application, I emphasised the importance of field naturalist clubs and that their publications contained critical information about the flora and fauna of their specific regions across time. And this information is essential to tracking changes in distribution and abundance, and they also track the appearance and disappearance of key species like pest and, in, and introduced species and endangered and threatened species. And these publications of field naturalist clubs also contain critical information about the social and community history of the organisations themselves. This is a page from the Tasmanian Field Naturalist Club's Easter Camp report. What's pictured there is the women's tent from that camp in 1909. So this publication includes record of the contribution that women have made to our understanding of biodiversity of this specific area in the very early 1900s. 
We received a small, a very small travel stipend as part of this grant, which has allowed us to travel by train to each of these regional locations. Um, this is the March edition of the Castlemaine Field Naturalist Club, where they wrote up our visit. So we gave a talk at their um, at their monthly meeting, and then we met with them to go through their archives and records and publications and historic photographs. And they then wrote up an article about our visit. So we are now uploading material that talks about us uploading material onto BHL. I uh, visited the, the Ballarat Field Naturalist Club the weekend before last and spoke at their monthly meeting. And I showed them that we had uploaded all of their uh, magazines onto the Biodiversity Heritage Library. They were all freely accessible online. This has never been available online, this publication. And at the end of that first edition, um, there was an article about squirrels. This squirrel was kind of live before and coloured, but it's kind of going extinct. Um, so in this article, this article about squirrels, it says, Mr. Thomas would like to know when you last saw a squirrel in Ballarat. Now, Ballar squirrels are not native to Australia, introduced, and but there had been a single pair that used to match, um, and they were introduced to the Ballarat Botanic Gardens in 1837. And this single pair grew to a population of 100 before they went, oh, we really should eradicate them. So Mr. Thomas was wanting to know, were they really extinct or are people still seeing them? When was the last time he saw them? And so I said, wouldn't it be great to speak to Mr. Thomas about this? And they said, well, Mr. Thomas is in the audience. So 50 years exactly after this magazine was published, I was able to talk to Mr. Thomas about whether or not he received any squirrel sightings. Turned out he hadn't, so they were extinct. But that was incredibly rewarding. He was overwhelmed that we'd put this content online. He was also amazed. He and the other um, people in that organisation were just so grateful that we had also put all the article data in for all of the articles in their magazine and that those articles were now available not just in the BHL catalogue as searchable items but also via external search engines. They were amazed that we'd add, added digital object identifiers to all of their articles which brought them into the modern linked network of scholarly research so that people could persistently cite them. They were super excited about the fact that they could click on their names and link through to all of the publications that they had not just in their own newsletters uh, but also in other ones. So this was the secretary of the club, who's an orchid specialist. She's published in all sorts of different um, publications that we've digitised, and there she was able to see that she had had a whole lot of publications on BHL. That was super exciting. But they were blown away by the fact that all of the species names in all of their newsletters were had been pulled out by BHL, and you could click on those species names. So again, thank you, Dima and Jeff and David. Um, this was amazing for them. They could click on those scientific names. They could get a list of every single mention of that scientific name across all 61 million pages of the BHL website. And we scrolled down and we found that 16 mentions of this endangered orchid species were from their newsletter. So this was their contribution to our global understanding of biodiversity. And then they were super excited because you can link from BHL to iNaturalist. And this was, they were like, we use our naturalist all the time. We use it to collect our species descriptions and collect, sorry, our species observations. And we encourage all members of our community and our club to do the same. You can click from BH, from this landing page on iNaturalist, from all the profile pages and all of the species on iNaturalist, you can click back to the Biodiversity Heritage Library. So there was a direct link from iNaturalist. I'm just waiting for everyone to take photos. Mm -hmm. Directly linked from BHL back to their all of their mentions in their publication of that species. So this blew their minds. We've now digitised over 20,000 pages from the publications of Victoria's Field Naturalist Clubs. All that local knowledge is now online and freely accessible. And then last year we got another grant. Um, the Wikimedia Australia had been wanting to work with us for some time. They said, have you got a project that we can fund? I said, well, hell yeah. Uh, so they said, Here's a grant. We want you to gather the rich social and natural histories of these Victorian field naturalist clubs, make them freely accessible and discoverable across the Wikisphere. We want you to make Wikipedia articles, Wikipedia, Wikidata records, and Wikimedia Commons records. Um, and so we've now done this. Um, we've also made uh, Wikipedia pages for their people, their events, their places, and their species. We've put important things like this is the emblem of the club for Ballarat on that species page. And we've made new pages for the, for the clubs. And so these pages are relatively extensive. They have links to BHL from their publication section. They link through, through the restaurants list, through to all sorts of links on BHL. And in total now we've created um, four completely new pages. We've edited and expanded and added BHL references to 21 other articles, over 15,000 words and 161 references. And we're just 
really ramping this project up now. So overall, all of those 50 contributors in BHL Australia have contributed almost 600,000 pages of Australia's biodiversity knowledge, which of course are all now openly accessible online. If you want to know more about BHL Australia, please follow us on Twitter, BHL underscore AU, or via our LinkedIn page. Thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions? Hello, this is a question for Dr. Maureen. <clears throat> so you showed an image of the female horseflies having what you described as dicoptic eyes and the males had monoptic eyes, but it seemed like the males had a, the amatidia on the lower hemisphere seemed I think lighter than the top hemisphere. What's the difference between those two uh, hemispheres on the male compound eyes? That is an excellent question. Uh, yes, so some of the males, I think almost the, as I mentioned, uh, they're harder to see in collection. They do have a difference in size in omatidia. We don't really know. Uh, for the females, it's usually the same size. So we don't know if they are more sensitive to difference of, of light because they are seeking um, nutrition mainly for flowers. Uh, yeah, well, I, that's an excellent question. And we, we don't really know that much about their, their biology yet. So. All right, that's interesting. Do you think it might perhaps have to deal with a wavelength of light that the females may give off that the males will be able to see? For mating purposes, it it could be. I yeah. Mm. I my guess would be either for finding mates or for, for finding food. This is these are the two main uh, drivers of uh, morphological. Uh, so yeah. All right, that's interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. So my question is for is he. Because the car was ready. <laughs> Have you tried other colors of car to see if the technique works? <laughs> that is also a very good question. Uh, we don't know. We think it's a mix of the heat of the engine, carbon dioxide of the exhaust, uh, the polarized light or the color of the hood. James' car just happens to be red, so that's all what we were using. Uh, this summer, we are going into the field and we are trying to get some more cars uh, to test out, in, including an electric car. Mm. Uh, so I think it's a combination of factors. Uh, but yeah, for, for some reason, they as soon as they start driving, they're, they're just zooming around the car. Continuing the theme of, of horse spies. So I understand there's, there's an hypothesis that Zebra stripes may be partly an adaptation to discourage horse flies attacking them. Do you have any comment on that idea? Uh, yeah, so I read an article that uh, zebras, uh, the, the uh, stripes, I don't know which one, <laughs> which is close to that, <laughs> uh, but those stripes are very disruptive. Uh, and that's uh, specifically for you know, uh, it had to do something with the with the polarized light. Uh, so yeah, it it just it. I think it works for other uh, hematophagous insects as well, uh, not only uh, horseflies but uh, mosquitoes and other biting flies. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a very interesting. You know, that that was a very interesting finding. And but there's still this debate if it's the color or if it's the polarization. Uh, because, yeah, they don't seem to go for the darker parts of the zebras. They just stay away. So I think it, it's, it has a ten, I think the, the polarization of light has a, has a role in it. I had a question for Anderson. Um, those pikas are so cute. And you had a slide that um, people compare them to guinea pigs and other ro hamsters, rodents. 
Are those ever domesticated? Do people have them as pets? No, not that I know of. I know they are like very hard to keep outside of their alpine kind of habitat, mm -hmm. but they are very common there. So when you are driving across the Tibet, you see them crossing the road and they are very active during the day, mm -hmm. but I never heard people domesticated them. This question is for Nicole. Um, you briefly mentioned volunteers. I wonder if you could give us a sense of the relative importance of volunteer uh, contributions to the kind of work that you do. We couldn't do our work without our volunteers. Um, we've got a very small, we're all part-time staff. Um, though some of those volunteers have been with us since the project began in 2010. Um, they know more about the project than we do and actually they could kind of run it without us. So in terms of that bus factor, if all the staff were hit by a bus, we probably could keep going. Um, we were unfunded from 2012 to 2014, just before I started. Um, the volunteers ran the project. The librarians literally like would wheel up a, a trolley of books and then the rest of the magic happened. It all just They all just became available online. The institutional knowledge and the heads of those volunteers is incredible. Um, I've got two volunteers that go across to Hawaii for four months and kind of escape our winter. They continue working for me online while they're there. And they could literally start the Bishop's Museum BHL project. Um, and also they were the ones knocking on my door the day after we locked down and said, what are we doing from home? And I said, mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm doing from home. Yeah. <laughs> and so those volunteers actually pretty much the reason that we started the Persistent Identifier Working Group that we've been, that I've been making articles accessible online because that's what we did. We flipped from accessibility to discoverability because those volunteers would not stop knocking on the door. So I had to give them something to do and it's been amazing. <laughs> Uh, this is more of a, a comment um, for you, Nicole. I just wanted to say how impressed I was to see, um, I know you've told the story before, but just to give you the public congratulations that you were able to um, very nimbly move your digitization function from one institution across the city, you said, to another and to camp out for four months and to digitize their materials. That would be wonderful. I wish there was a way that um, we could somehow uh, outsource that digitization function or to receive all of those materials that you do through the post or through the special couriers to do the digitization. Um, I think that hands-on work that the Museums Victoria is doing is, is really essential that you've helped co coordinate all that. So thank you. Um, actually, I had a quick question for Siobhan in terms of the Wikiverse. What's next for the Wikiverse? We've seen it expand from Wikipedia to Wikimedia to Wikidata. What's left for Wiki to conquer? <laughs> Structured data. So basically the way I see the BHL, I don't regard it as a book. I regard it as unlinked data. And I want that data to be linked. And so, and I can see the particularly Wikidata, but also structured data on commons, which is basically putting the metadata of images in a structured form so it's linked and able to be um, queried so you can ask questions and get answers that would otherwise be impossible. And that's where I see the potential. Yeah, it's the, the BHL is chock full of data that at the moment is dark data. You can't link it. Sometimes you don't even know it's there. And I would like to be able to get my hands on it and start reusing it and linking it. Yeah. Just a, a quick question, because I'm not sure, and depending on who's in the room, we have been talking about a Wikimedian in residence. And I was wondering if through like through the glam structure, might there be a way to, I'm not sure formalize is the right word, but sort of drum up this connection between the glam world and the natural history collections so that like having a Wikimedia in residence, I'm thinking of Weedig Bio. For those of you who don't know it, it's a four day event once a year to around the world. People can join a project virtually and transcribe all different kinds of data. So I was thinking if you could do something similar with the 
the local Wikipedia world where I know here at the Field Museum, first time Weedig Bio existed, they had like a, I don't know, remember now, fourfold or something over the expected number of people turn up to do this work. And I was expecting, I'm wondering if the same thing would happen with Wikipedia, wiki data edit-a-thon kind of things, that it would produce a wiki community inside the Field Museum and other places. What do you think? Again, it would be up to the institution as to what their priorities are for a Wikimedian in residence. Um, normally, the scope of work is decided by the institution. Certainly, I see there's a lot of potential for, like you said, uh, holding editathons, be they structured data or images or um, pushing out um, institutional knowledge into Wikipedia through, you know, adding, creating articles and doing references via things. Um, but it depends on, it, normally the best Wikipedia in residence positions, there's a focused aim and you achieve bit by bit by bit. So I always like to, if it's too wide, you don't have enough time or one person, it's normally one person, have enough ability to actually deliver if the aims are too wide. So if I, I would encourage certainly all institutions to have a Wikipedian in residence because I think it, it helps them contact one of the best ways to push out their knowledge to everybody because Google really is just a link to Wikipedia. Um, and, the, and then really focus in on what they want to prioritise. Yeah. And then also have a general plan of saying, okay, we're doing this for this Wikipedia in residence, then we're going to do this for the next one, maybe the same person, maybe a different person with a different set of skills. Yeah. Uh, Siobhan, I have a question for you too. Um, so uh, the way I'm thinking about Wikipedia, oh, sorry, uh, about VHL as data, um, as a jigsaw puzzle, and uh, for example, name is a specific type of a puzzle. And um, uh, the more of them we find, the more we connect, and the easier it is for the next, next, and next. Um, what, like, if you agree with this idea, um, what do you think are next uh, pieces that we need to concentrate on? Like, our people, um, geographical things, so time. You know how I just said focus on be quite focused and that particular in the answer to that question I'm going to go flip it right over and I'm going to say everything. <laughs> I want everything to be linked. I'm a link everything, and I find it very difficult when you're talking about linking data in comparison to a say Wikimedia in a residence. I want everything linked. So I want all you know locations. For example, I want the historic names of those locations linked to the current name of that location. I want the multiple versions, name strings of a person to be linked to an identifier, be it an ORCID or a Wikidata item, so that, that you know that person is that person and you can link their contributions to them. Um, yeah, species name, same thing. I want the species name and its synonyms to be linked to each other and linked to the BHL um, publication that's the original description, not just of the current species name, but also the other synonyms and the publications that say this is a synonym rather than you're talking about the same thing. Yeah, I want it all linked, everything. So sorry, I don't have a narrow, mm -hmm. I don't have a narrow focus when it comes to that. I, I have a uh, bigger question. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, for example, there is a dynamic uh, adaptation and genetic adaptation. And uh, for people, for example, they specifically go training at a high altitude to be, um, and they can accommodate. Uh, how much of, the, of uh, you think it is nature, how much it is uh, uh, nurture in uh, for pickers to be able to adapt. So this is exactly the kind of question we are tagging now, because basically what we want to answer is, can mountain mammals in general be able to adapt it as fast as the climate change are coming? Like, can they have the same rate as the as the warming happening? 
So basically that is the question we have to tackle. We know that for some specifically function like the oxygen absorption is much faster than for other functions like the UV protection. We expect that for the UV protection is much uh, longer project that's not just like few days that can develop this change. But we are just start to explore this because we have data from a very extreme high and middle. We are now want to see the what happened as you go up the mountain. It is a gradual change or is it a, a specific threshold? There is a dramatic genetic change. So with that information, we might be able to determine, for example, what will be the upslope limit the middle could go in 100 years or they can just continue going at the warming. So that's exactly what we're trying to figure out the next step. I think that's a good place to end. Oh, well, we have one more, sorry. <laughs> had, had one more question. Um, it, it's mostly BHL. It might also be a, a Wikiverse kind of question about um, a possible development. Has there been any thought given to geographic search capability, for example, that is not restricted to place names. So for example, if you, if you need to, I mean, this is key to biodiversity research, for example, that you might say uh, the Southeastern region of Africa, but you would also have to say, you know, Angola, Namibia, Botswana, and then you might also have to name all of the named places, all the cities and towns and parks. But if there were a geospatially referenced way to overlay um, geospatial information to identify a region and somehow map that in, might that be something, a direction that would be important or valuable for this kind of search? There's, um, to give you one, one example of how far we've got. So in, so in Biostore, one of the things I've been trying to do is in the BHL text, people often mention latitude and longitude. You can extract that. So if you go to the homepage of Biostore, there's a map, and it's just littered with points where people have been referencing localities. And I mean, the interface is incredibly crude, but you can go and click on that, and you can draw a box around region and say, the, show me the papers in that area. It's a bit similar, I don't know if you come across a project called Journal Map, which is trying to do much the same kind of thing, to sort of make it make it possible to search for literature on all sorts of topics geospatially without requiring Smila, Mozambique, et cetera. Yeah. 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 And I'm not sure how it will prove to connect, but there's a new initiative called Overture, I think, O-V-E-R-T-U-R-E. -E. Um, this recognition that gazetteers would have that kind of information, right? This is part of Southeast, these are included, the subsections, et cetera, synonyms, yeah. former names. And there's a recognition that we're better together kind of thing, and the different big projects out there in the world who have built these sort of giant gazetteers and ways for us to search are sort of joining forces together now. To, yeah, because they've realized that it's a huge thing and to do it well, they're doing it better together. And there may be opportunities to connect those kinds of things. Just on top of that, as soon as you've got a database and that database is open, there's no one stopping you uploading that data into Wikidata. And so you link things in Wikidata. So that all these databases will have an identifier for a particular name or a particular location. It's just a matter of disambiguating the two and attaching it to a Wikidata item, and then you can build tools, visualization tools on top of it. So, and query it, yeah. Thank you, thank you all very much. I think it's been, uh, it's wonderful to have all these questions. It's been some really engaged with the uh, split talks today, which is fantastic, thank you. Um, which all that remains is me to draw the day to a close. And what an afternoon it has been, really. Um, some fascinating talks and discoveries and accomplishments, not just from the past 17 years, but also well beyond. I think what remains clear to us all is that while much has been achieved, there are still many challenges and opportunities for further work and research. BHL itself has clearly remained a key backbone throughout in supporting this work 
and fulfilling its role as part of core infrastructure for biodiversity research. I'd like to move on to some thank yous now. I'd just like to say a huge thank you to all our speakers today. Um, we'll give them a round of applause, shall we? Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thanks also to Gretchen Rings here from the Field Museum and also Leora Segal from the uh, Chicago Botanic Garden for all their co-hosting co co of the 2024 annual meeting this week here in Chicago. So thank you both. I'd like to say thank you to all the Field Museum staff who have both uh, facilitated our week and also both the online meeting and AV requirements this afternoon and of course the Chicago Botanic Garden staff as well for welcoming us and, uh, and looking after us so well. A special thank you to Colleen Funkhauser, our BHL program manager, for endless support and for making this run incredibly smoothly. Uh, and thanks to Teresa at the back there also for fielding the uh, online side of the meeting, which is much appreciated. I'd like to thank you all for joining us, uh, both in person and online this afternoon. And uh, just to say that pretty much concludes our symposium for today. Thank you all and safe journeys home. Thank you.